morning's uh, meeting of the London Assembly's Transport Committee. Um, can I welcome uh, members who are here today, officers and the public who I think probably are mostly watching on home rather than um, in the chamber today. Um, can we make sure everyone has their electronic devices switched to silent or off? Please don't put them on vibrate because the microphones can pick that up. Um, so we don't have any unnecessary disruptions. Can I start off um, by asking Maria Burton, our clerk, if we've got any apologies for this morning? Yes, we've got apologies from Assemblymember Desai and Assemblymember Garrett, and we've got Assemblymembers Duval and Best attending in as substitutes. Lovely, thank you. Welcome, Assemblymembers Duval and Best to the Transport Committee. I think we've got a good meeting ahead of us. I hope you enjoy it this morning. Um, declarations of interest. Can I ask the committee to note the recommendations set out at item two, and have members got any other interest to declare? No, so is that noted? Nods, nobody speaking this morning. Thank you. <laughs> minutes, can we confirm the minutes of the Transport Committee meeting held on the 30th of June 2021 to be signed by me as a correct record? Agreed. Thank you very much. Everyone's quiet this morning. Um, item four, summary list of actions. Can we note the ongoing actions arising from the previous meeting of the committee? Agreed. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. right, let's move on to our main item today, which is um, looking at London's river crossings, which um, is a really important issue, looking at how they're managed, but also the resilience of river crossings in London, particularly in light of our the current issues we have with Hammersmith Bridge. So I'd like to welcome our guests. We've got them in two panels. We've got two guests hopefully it may be one we're just having some issues joining us internationally at 12 o'clock but our, our first panel um this morning um if i could welcome you i'm going to go around um left to right david rowe who is the head of surface major projects and renewals sponsorship at transport for london welcome david gareth powell managing director of surface transport tfl Good to see you. Morning. I'm David Farnsworth, who's the managing director of Bridge House Estates, which manages a number of the bridges in London. Um, John Stevenson, government relations lead for the Port of London Authority. And Tom Osborne, who is director of Knights Architects and has a lot of experience on crossing. So thank you all so much for joining us this morning. So we've got um, one or two international guests joining us from midday. But if I could kick off the questions, and if I could start with Gareth and David Farnsworth, and I guess, Gareth, if you want David to pick up anything, David Rowe to pick up anything, let me know. Um, but my first question is, can you just provide an overview of the river crossings that your organisations manage and how they're maintained? So what's, what, how do you manage it? Thanks, Chair. So um, Transport for London has uh, direct responsibility for a number of uh, bridges uh, over rivers across London. Uh, in terms of the most uh, high profile ones of those, uh, we have responsibility for seven bridges over the Thames. Uh, two tunnels uh, under the Thames and we're the highway authority for the road that goes over a further three bridges uh, over the Thames uh, in London. In common with uh, the majority of all highway assets, uh, we have a planned uh, maintenance and inspection regime for our highways assets. It's a well-proven uh, methodology that we use to assess uh, the condition of those uh, assets. And we undertake two types of maintenance, day-to-day uh, -day type maintenance, if you like, which is uh, about making sure that the asset, uh, the bridge or the tunnel, uh, remains in operation, is serviceable, clearing up any issues uh, that arise. And then interventions where we need to renew the asset uh, in some way because, for example, if it needs painting uh, on a regular cycle to stop further degradation uh, of a bridge uh, or indeed ultimately to intervene uh, and to actually structurally repair the bridge. So all types of assets have a different mechanism, a different um, regime. It depends on the nature of that asset, what it's made of, what type of vehicles or pedestrians it's carrying and so on. Uh, but we set that out as, as TfL in our long-term plans, in our long-term capital plans and also in our business plans and then down into our budgets uh, by which we then allocate specific tasks in the financial year ahead. David. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so just for a moment, I take you back in terms of history. So the uh, Bridge House Estates charity actually goes back to the 11th century, which was when there was one bridge crossing, London Bridge, um, and there was a levy to actually raise a fee uh, to repair that bridge. And from that moment in time, rolling through the centuries, um, the charity endowment uh, was set up and stewarded by the sole trustee, the City of London Corporation. Um, and the primary objects of the charity are the maintenance and support of Tower Bridge, London Bridge, Blackfriars, Southwark, 
and Millennium Bridge. Um, and those bridges are maintained with in-house expertise uh, at the trustee of the City of London Corporation and also outsourced expert uh, contracts through uh, ACOM. So there's a 50-year um, forward trajectory in terms of maintenance and repair and a rigorous inspection uh, regime. And so this endowment is the source of the funding to actually maintain and support those five bridges. And then unusually, what the money that is not used for those five bridges is then distributed for the benefit of communities across London tackling inequality and disadvantage through the charitable funding arm called City Bridge Trust. Thank you, Chair. Look, a 50-year plan, you're saying. What's, what's your plan at TfL? I mean, do you look for a similar horizon? And could you also, Gareth, just talk a bit, I know it's not directly in your area, but there are other, other crossings such as... Um, you know, the tube tunnels, yeah. dear loved. Could you just give us a flavour of that as well, please? Yes, of course. So, so similar, we have a, um, a review of the life of an asset over a long period. So for uh, things like bridges and tunnels, that's typically 50 years in common with uh, my colleague here. Uh, we take a view, therefore, as to where the asset is in its life cycle, from new to middle age to uh, towards the end of its age, or indeed to uh, renew that asset so that its, uh, its age can be continued on. Um, that applies to all of the assets that we look at, so it's exactly the same process we do for the DLR tunnels, uh, for London Underground tunnels, as we do for road tunnels uh, and so on. So that's a long-term uh, view. And then in terms of the funding of that long-term view, that is then down to having long-term sustainable funding and indeed down to fully funding business plans in the short to medium term. And so the same process, it, whether it's a, a railway tunnel, the underground DLR or whether it's a, a road or pedestrian? Yeah, it's exactly the same process. Clearly the parameters change slightly depending on the nature of what it's built from or what it's in and also the type of uh, vehicle or traffic that it's carrying. So you can expect, for example, uh, similar issues like water ingress to be common to all tunnels or to bridges uh, and so on because they're, they're large civil structures open to the elements or with water uh, around them. But there will be some differences, of course, depending on whether it's a, a foot-only bridge or whether it's uh, uh, something that's carrying very heavy goods vehicles. But the same process applies entirely consistently with all of them. Do you have in-house expertise like um, the City of London have? That work on this, we do, yes. So we have uh, we have a dedicated engineering uh, department that has dedicated bridge engineers, uh, tunnel engineers, uh, ventilation engineers, etc. But we also uh, rely where we need to on external expertise, uh, like the organisation that David mentioned and others. Thank you. Um, for, for both of you again, what are the busiest river crossings that you manage for vehicles, for cyclists, and for pedestrians? You want to go first. David, why don't you go first? I'm afraid I don't have all that breakdown, uh, Chair, so if I could actually uh, provide you with that. Um, but uh, uh, the interplay between when one is shut and the other is displaced, um, we've seen keenly uh, when we shut Tower Bridge fairly recently. It took five years, actually, to organise that shutting, uh, you know, working with all of the stakeholders. Uh, but it was done in a way which was coordinated, I believe. So in terms of um, the uh, river crossings that TfL is responsible for, the Blackwell Tunnel uh, is, carries the most motor vehicles uh, alongside um, Vauxhall Bridge uh, and over in Twickenham Bridge. Uh, in terms of uh, pedestrian flows, uh, Vauxhall, again, very high pedestrian flows, as is Westminster Bridge. Uh, and then in terms of cycling, uh, Vauxhall Bridge again carries, of our bridges, uh, the largest uh, flow of cyclists. <laughs> The numbers, do you have that with you at all? We can send that through to you, Chair. Yeah, this. just trying to get the scale of the sort of... I mean, some of these bridges obviously were built for far fewer and lighter vehicles and, and uh, people movement over it. So, OK, thank you very just much Just to give you a, a sort of sense of that, uh, Chair. So, um, Blackwall Tunnel will carry something in the order of 100,000 vehicles a day and Rotherhithe Tunnel, 20,000 vehicles a day. So, quite a difference in scale just on two very adjacent crossings. Yeah. And then obviously you've got something like Woolwich Ferry that's very constrained in terms of its capacity due to its nature. Yeah, lovely. That's helpful. Thank you. Be useful to get that data for us. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, if I need to Gareth and David before I bring others in, what are the biggest challenges to you in maintaining these river crossings? 
Uh, so for us, it's the coordination. I mean, it's incredibly busy, uh, the river, um, and many of our colleagues around the table and different stakeholders. It's actually getting that time slot when you can actually do uh, the repair or replacements that are, are needed. So I think as a, a headline, that would be the biggest challenge. And then if you drill down into that, you could see where some of the, uh, uh, the, the interplay is, is more vexed or, or not. But uh, that's the, the number one. I said earlier that when you closed Tower Bridge, and I have to say, I've, I've been here 13 years, you're regularly maintaining it and painting it and, and had a few closures, but um, you took five years to plan that. Yeah, absolutely, and that was to try and mitigate the, the, the impacts, but also taking account of planned river work that was already happening uh, to make sure that that window uh, was uh, most, most opportune. Um, and also we try and coordinate the, the maintenance and repair on one bridge so that you get economies of uh, well, efficiency and effectiveness in terms of coinciding certain jobs at the same time. So it's that slot, the coordination, and then trying to make the, uh, the best use of the charitable asset in terms of being uh, uh, efficient and effective. Thank you. And Gareth, what are the biggest challenges for you? Well, perhaps to put it in context, Chair, so the um, bridges and tunnels over and under the river are some of the more complicated assets to maintain that the highway has. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, often they're very old um, and uh, some of them are well over 100 years old, as, as you will know, uh, and therefore constructed of old materials uh, with different techniques, often with poor records uh, from their original construction uh, available. Secondly, actually working on these assets is quite challenging. Uh, having to work over a, over a river, over a navigable uh, environment, uh, you know, they're very difficult. They're constrained spaces uh, in themselves, and particularly for tunnels, uh, working in a confined space also uh, presents challenges. And as David says, that one of the other challenges is that uh, they are very well used, and therefore there isn't the ability to shut them for long periods of time uh, to maintain them. So that means the work has to be compressed into evenings, uh, into weekends, uh, which is more costly, but also requires high level of coordination uh, because we can't have too many uh, crossings over the river closed at any one point in time because that would significantly disrupt London's businesses uh, and the flow of people and goods uh, from both sides of the city. So it's really important that we plan we, we take a lot of time to make sure things are coordinated and also to make sure uh, that the methodologies we use uh, are appropriate. But all of that brings together, it drives up cost uh, and it makes them very difficult assets which you have to plan for carefully. So both you find you've got some newer assets as well. The Millennium Bridge isn't that old. In fact, I remember voting for it when I was a councillor way back when. But, but also you've got the cable car, which is a new crossing. Are they easier to maintain because they've been built more recently? You've got the plans or do they present their own challenges? David. Um, so, yes, in terms of the records, absolutely, we have, have all of that. Um, I think in terms of the, um, the also the um, materials used for uh, the Millennium Bridge, obviously very different uh, to Tower Bridge, for example. So that, that, to some extent, is easier. But to be honest, we integrate the planning of the five bridges um, very closely with each other for exactly the point that Gareth's been making in terms of the coordination. And also, there's a sweet spot when you look to replace a bridge or maintain a bridge. So plotting that on the 50-year trajectory, you know, because it may become uneconomic uh, to actually maintain a bridge. But there may be other um, historic and cultural reasons, uh, as well as business efficiency, uh, which are the drivers. And yes, Chair, you are, you are right. So in terms of materials or methodologies and, and what we know, we, clearly assets vary. And the more modern they are, the more modern techniques have been used in their construction. Uh, and in some cases, they've been planned with an eye to, uh, to renewal in the future uh, in that way. Obviously, the cable car is a different type of crossing. It is possible to uh, bring the gondolas away every night as we do and conduct maintenance on, on land, if you like, rather than uh, across in the middle of the river. So uh, it has certain different characteristics to it. Uh, but the same process applies. We have to do uh, very careful planning and very good coordination. Uh, and we also have to make sure that we can uh, get the right interventions at the right time uh, in, that, in that assets life cycle uh, in order to maintain that overall uh, efficiency uh, of delivery. Thank you. Right, I'll now bring in Assembly Member Prince. Thank you, Chair. Um, first question uh, is to let's ask David first. Um, how do you work with other crossing owners to plan major works and closures or crossings? I mean, you've already alluded to that. Sure. So um, my colleagues working in-house on the engineering uh, brief um, are very closely in touch with many of the stakeholders, again, some represented around this uh, uh, table, um, both in terms of, you know, informally and in terms of just day-to-day -day business um, uh, contact, but also uh, through organised uh, groupings such as the Cross River 
uh, partnership which TfL uh, use uh, and lead. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of those trusted relationships, uh, making sure that we try and use our expertise in a generous um, and collaborative way, but also recognising that you know, things change and we all need to keep talking to each other to improve. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Gareth, can I ask the same question of yourself? Yeah, so in, in common with David, we have, um, there are a number of London-wide groups that meet uh, in order to coordinate this between the London boroughs, between other stakeholders, Network Rail, of course, who have uh, river crossings in London uh, and others. Uh, and they meet uh, often quarterly uh, and there's an overall plan uh, developed. There is then a statutory process for highways in particular, uh, which, is, which is part of the overall control of highways, uh, where notification of works and permits and so on need to be uh, given, and there's a process for consulting adjacent highway authorities and other stakeholders uh, as part of that process. Uh, we also uh, at TFL take an overview of the whole network, and if there are emergency works that need to be conducted, uh, not necessarily by a bridge owner, but maybe there's an issue uh, with some form of asset going over it from a statutory undertaker like a gas company or a water company, then again we can coordinate that quite widely. We've got very established channels to communicate with people, with stakeholders uh, and with Londoners and businesses uh, if there is uh, an emergency intervention that has to be made. Uh, we try and get that information out as quickly as possible uh, and then work with whoever it is uh, to resolve that issue uh, and then get the service back up and running. So it is, from a TfL perspective, about coordination not only for the bridges but then multimodally and making sure that therefore river crossings, if they're uh, available by bus network, for example, uh, and tube network, that we do our best to coordinate uh, to make sure that people can get their flows right. What do you do in real time, though? So in real time, you mean for an emergency? Uh, well, let me give you an example. Last night, I tried to get across the River Thames, and I couldn't. I um, went to Blackwall Tunnel. This is at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. I went to Blackwall Tunnel. It was blocked mm -hmm. for whatever reason. I then thought, oh, I know. I'll go to... Uh, the Dartford Crossing went there and I sat there for nearly two hours waiting to get across because they decided they'd close one tunnel and then the one that was open had a car accident and that was it and eventually they opened the right hand tunnel but there was no notification anywhere during the course of my journey that any of this was going wrong so I didn't have the option when I when I was going towards Blackwell Tunnel if I'd have had notification I could have used um, the uh, Rotherhide Tunnel or even gone over Tower Bridge. But there was no notification, no notification on my way to Blackwall Tunnel that there was a problem, no notification on my way to uh, Dartford Tunnel that there was going to be a problem. And, of course, on my way to Dartford Tunnel, of course, I noticed that the Woolwich Ferry is on strike today. <laughs> so, in terms of last night, so the issue on the Blackwell Tunnel that you experienced, and I'm sorry that you were caught up in that, uh, was an issue of a failure of a number of CCTV cameras, and because of the safety critical nature of being able to see into the tunnel at all times, that meant that the tunnel had to be closed immediately when those CCTV cameras failed, so that engineers could access uh, into the tunnel uh, and sort out the issue that was going on with those uh, cameras themselves. So in that case, that's a short-term emergency intervention. Uh, we'd rather not have those, uh, but when they do occur, we do try to get the message out via travel bulletins, uh, via updating of sat-navs and so on, and indeed via our variable messaging signs that we have in various places around the network. That can take a little bit of time. We do do our best. We've got established processes where we immediately put that information out via dedicated information desks inside the central London uh, control centre uh, that we run. It is obviously then equally doubly unfortunate when other crossings uh, are impacted in different ways, uh, either by strike action in the case of the Woolwich Ferry or indeed uh, in respect of that um, incident that you referred to uh, on, the, uh, on the Highways England network. So uh, we just do our best to get the information out there and I'm very sorry if it didn't reach you uh, in time yesterday, but the teams do work very hard to do that as the best they can. Thank you. Um, so, well, you, I think you've answered those questions you've answered. Um, so, just a, another question to you, Gareth. Um, how much of the bridge maintenance work you do is proactive and how much is reactive? So, that obviously depends on the nature of the asset and where it is uh, in its life cycle. Historically, we have tried to be maintaining on bridges uh, in the same way as described by my colleague here uh, on a planned intervention basis over a long period. And the reason that's important is because you can do little and often maintenance and you can get in and you can stop the degradation uh, of the assets. But in order to be able to do that, you need to have a long-term financial plan. You need to be able to afford to do that intervention 
at the time at which you, you have to do it. So to give you an example, one of those interventions is the painting of bridges. Now, that obviously uh, can appear to be cosmetic. Actually, it has a, an engineering function, my colleagues tell me, which is to stop uh, water ingress and to keep uh, the bridge itself uh, in good condition. Now, to paint a bridge doesn't sound like much, but that's probably getting on for a £10 million exercise by the time you've got all of the equipment necessary, you've got people on and over bridges, all the coordination that we talked about, all of the intervention. That's why they're so difficult. And, of course, you can imagine that when uh, funding is tight, uh, those issues can easily be deferred, as they have been uh, in the past. And at present, as you know, uh, during the pandemic, TfL's financial situation is such uh, that we're not able to do as much proactive maintenance as we would like to uh, at the moment because of the financial situation. So therefore, we end up doing reactive maintenance. And what I mean by that is when a problem occurs, like the CCTV camera issue uh, that you experienced, unfortunately, Keith, uh, yesterday, or indeed uh, other issues that might occur, like a, a pothole developing on a road surface or other things, then we're sending people out in real time to fix it. That obviously causes disruption because we're not able to plan that intervention. So the proportion of reactive maintenance as a total proportion has gone up over recent years as the long-term funding certainty has decreased. Uh, I mean, do you think that what happened last night would have been avoidable had you done some proactive maintenance on that CCTV? Well, I can't comment on the, on the specifics because I don't actually know uh, what the root cause of that, of that failure was. Uh, but nonetheless, it's certainly true to say, uh, in general, that the more you can plan to intervene at stages of where you know it needs to, in particular life cycles of assets, then the more that you uh, reduce uh, the amount of intervention that you need on an unplanned basis. Uh, and certainly that's what we aim to do, where we have the funding. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking you the same question, David, because you've answered it already. So thank sure. You. Thank you. No problem. Um, before I bring you John, could you just um, say what the PLA's role is in terms of the coordination of these major works on these river crossings? Our role is um, to work with either the asset owner or the contractor to make sure that any um, maintenance that will involve the river is done in a safe way. Um, that is a sort of rolling program and broadly that can lead to things like arch closures but that's done in a sort of um, constructive way and, and carries on without much uh, incident day to day. So it's quite routine for you yeah, managing indeed. that? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Assemblymember Baker. Chair, um, just, just for completeness, I'd uh, just like to ask, we're obviously focusing on the, on the crossings um, around the river, Thames, but I understand there are 89 TfL crossings and 1,004 borough crossings of watercourses across London. Um, and I think this question will be for, for David Rowe. Um, does managing and maintaining these crossings differ to the crossings over the Thames? Of the Thames. So Gareth's talked about the inspections and maintenance regimes that we have. It uh, applies to all types of crossings and all types of structures actually as well. So any elevated structures that we might have in terms of holding those records. We, uh, we share a common platform with all of the London boroughs called Bridge Station, which is how we record information around the condition of our assets and how the boroughs do the same. So all of that's um, available for, for sharing and informing investment decisions around when those interventions are necessary, both in terms of regular maintenance as well as those fuller renewals that are necessary. Thanks. Thank you. What's the name of that common platform? It's was? called uh, Bridge Station. Bridge Station? Yes. Okay, so this is a program. It's like a, da it's a database, essentially, where you just enter the information that you've recorded from your inspections, your regular maintenance regimes, to ensure that you have that plan of when it's appropriate to either intervene on a sort of day-to-day -day maintenance basis as well as when those fuller renewals are necessary. And you analyse that, do you, at TfL? So we certainly use it in relation to our own crossings and we've worked with the London boroughs in relation to things like the State of um, the Capital Report to help inform what's the investment that's necessary for all of London's river crossings. It's also a, a really useful form of information for us to work with an organisation called LOBEG, which is the London Bridges Engineering Group. And that group provides support to the London boroughs because obviously bridge engineering capability is quite a specialist field. Mm. Um, so LOBEG can help deploy resources where particular asset owners need them in terms of the expertise that they might not have in-house. Lovely, thank you. Assemblymember Duval. So for the 1,000-odd um, the borough crossings, how do they fund that? I, I get it that you have to fund your 89, but where they've got respons responsibility, how do they fund that maintenance and emergency work, presumably? Is that a grant from TfL or...? 
they find that money themselves? How is that done? So um, in recent years, we've had something called the uh, Bridge Strengthening Programme that TfL has been able to provide support to the London boroughs for, uh, and that's helped fund uh, inspections of over 700 uh, bridges and crossings, as well as um, put in place strengthening measures across 150 different crossings. The, the reality is that the resources available to that programme have reduced in recent years as the uh, government grant has reduced to TfL and obviously the most recent impact of the uh, COVID pandemic in terms of our finances have also taken a significant impact on that. So, so who holds the ring then on coordinating that work and prioritising the work? As the resources get reduced, not everybody could So that, that's the always work. been that's always been on the basis that we will look to provide help towards the London boroughs, but it's not been um, the sole means that uh, boroughs have been able to call upon. They have had to use their own resources in terms of uh, repairs to their crossings. The situation in London, though, is, at, is different to that outside of London, in that authorities outside of London are eligible to uh, receive a grant from government towards bridge strengthening, and that's not the case within the capital. So there's a, there's highlights a problem there. Can I just go back very quickly to an earlier question and answer some of the anomalies of whether you're... Uh, highways authority or not is that for the purposes of laws or is that for the purposes of forgive me i'm a lay person resurfacing roads or what what does that actually mean when you say for i think it was for three of the central london crossings that you're an high, highways authority that so perhaps i'll start i'll bring my colleague and maybe we can use tower bridge <coughs> as an example of that so tower bridge uh, transport for london is the highway authority um, my colleague here is obviously responsible for the asset itself and its overall maintenance. So the, the distinction is that the Highway Authority is responsible for the road itself, for the safety of the road, all the road safety aspects and so on uh, that it has. Clearly that road is quite often is just sitting in, uh, you know, it's on the surface, but where it's on the structure, then there's, there might be a different asset owner who's responsible for that overall integrity uh, of the asset. So that's the distinction between the two. In the majority of TfL's bridges, we're both the asset owner and the highway authority, but as you say, uh, there are three circumstances where we're simply the highway authority over the top. Did you want to add anything? No, that, that's exactly right, because the five bridges we have, uh, three of them, uh, TfL, are responsible as the highway authority. Then it's both Millennium and Southwark are the two where, respectively, City of London and City of London and Southwark are responsible as highway authority. But my colleague's right in terms of that distinction. Thank you. The useful distinction, because it, it's so complex, this, when you start looking into it and delving into it and all the owners. Um, Assemblymember Berry, you wanted to come in on this? Yeah, just, just a very quick question, going back um, with David Rowe, if that's right, about the, the, the tool you mentioned that's, that predicts when maintenance should be done um, in a very sort of integrated way. Presumably that looks at um, the level of use of the asset and things like the, the weight of the vehicles going across it, the volume of traffic, also the speed, those different things, they, they, all of those things would impact on the need for maintenance and that gets built into that tool. So the Bridge Station uh, records the surveys that are done in terms of the state of good repair of the asset, which is a sort of um, industry standard information that you record, but you're absolutely right, what you need to combine that with is also the level of degradation that you're seeing in terms of that asset combined with information on levels of use. So it's important that all of those factors are taken into consideration in terms of understanding when you, you look to make uh, planned interventions and what's the optimum time to do that in terms of trying to get the lowest overall what we call whole life cost. Uh, Gareth mentioned that uh, um, even painting a bridge can be in the order of 10 million but if you don't take that action what you tend to see is that the corrosion will worsen and therefore while she might be putting off your investment for a decade or so actually at that point you're then going back and you're having to pay a much higher overall cost in order to do those repairs yes absolutely um so yes yeah, so the 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 changes we're seeing at the moment i.e an increase in overall road traffic plus an increase in vehicle weights that we're seeing those would go into your model and presumably start to bring forwards some of the, the maintenance costs that you've got predicted for the future? Um, so the, the other key consideration with these is, is that the age of these assets means a lot of them weren't designed for today's traffic. Mm. So you're, you're quite right. Yeah, full um, stop. Yeah. Blackhall, rather high tunnel, designed for horses, carts and pedestrians. 
uh, and now obviously carrying a very, very different mix of users. So absolutely, that's a, that's a key consideration within it. Okay, and David Farnsworth, you use a similar tool, presumably the same one, I guess, there's the standard yeah. methodology. Because the trustee, um, the City of London Corporation, in its own uh, responsibilities beyond the charity, um, there are different uh, crossings such as uh, are being described um, uh, in terms of uh, whether it's small little rivers, you know, in terms of the borough. Um, I think just a, a point to pick up and link to um, Tower Bridge, obviously for us, is the bridge that actually in terms of the weighting um, of vehicles over there, it's really important. So um, I think there'd be some interesting uh, data we can actually provide uh, after this session uh, from Tower Bridge. It's how we actually deal with that particular issue. That'd be fantastic. And just very quickly, um, I said earlier, I think speed would be one of the considerations, speed of the traffic, because if it's going faster, it would, I don't know, cause more, cause more damage when it hits um, bumps in the road and that kind of thing. Are all the bridges 20 miles an hour for, for vehicle traffic or not? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that either. Do you know with the ones that you manage? It, it does depend on the, the bridge in question. Um, so uh, certainly Tower Bridge is, is 20 miles an hour, um, but Brother Hyth Tunnel is 30 miles an hour, if I remember correctly. The tunnel's 20 miles an hour. Oh, it's a 20, yeah. Sorry, I wonder if we could Black get that information. That would be interesting. We'll collect that. We'll get we'll see some further information. Um, absolutely. And I think the other issue with all of this, talk about presumably you look at extreme weather, extreme heat, and when we've had the snow, that must have an impact and degrade your assets. It does. It does. So um, extreme weather events are obviously not great for big civil asset structures. Um, we do uh, look at, just as you suggest, uh, both uh, speed and usage, but also important to note that sometimes the way to stop an increase in, in degradation of an asset is actually to either reduce the weight of the vehicles that can go over it or through it, or indeed to reduce the speed of the vehicles that go through it, particularly if uh, there's a concern about the structure uh, of that asset and so on. And there are a number of TFL structures, not, not bridges necessarily over the river, but in the wider context of elevated structures where we do have those restrictions in place in order to make sure that the asset can safely be used and it would always be safe but that we don't go outside whatever the parameters that the engineers are assessing at the time uh, in terms of the type of usage uh, or the speed of the vehicles. And just to add in terms of forward plan I mean very much in terms of thinking about the the level of the Thames um, in terms of what may happen environmentally over this period. So whilst we're not in the lead on that, we're very much part of, uh, of the, those conversations. Thank you. Let's move on to the next question. Assemblymember Baker. On to two? Yeah. Sorry, thank you. OK, this is to Gareth Powell and David Farnsworth. Which of the river crossings that you manage are currently most in need of repair and maintenance? Should I... I start? Okay. Um, so the one that is the most uh, in need of uh, repair and maintenance is the Rotherhide Tunnel. Uh, the Rotherhide Tunnel, is, uh, as David has said, was, was built many years ago for a different type of purpose. Uh, at the moment, the um, systems within that tunnel uh, are in urgent need of uh, an upgrade. That is one of the reasons why there are restrictions uh, about the type of vehicles that can enter and go through that tunnel at the moment. That's in order uh, to make sure that we can continue uh, to operate the tunnel uh, safely. Uh, so we know that that needs to happen and we've got a very uh, advanced plan being developed at the moment with our engineers to get the right type of engineering solution uh, for the Rotherhide Tunnel and then to proceed through uh, to actually conduct that work. Uh, in terms of other crossings, the, the next one on our list is probably Vauxhall Bridge uh, where we've just undertaken some interventions in order to uh, try and uh, make sure that the asset, the water doesn't get into the asset but we know as part of that, in, those interventions, uh, we know that the actual state of the asset means that we'll have to come back within five years uh, and do more work uh, to, to Vauxhall Bridge. And so for each of them, we have these sets of uh, analyses uh, as to where we think uh, we need to go, what the, what the urgency of that is and what the restrictions are that we might need to put in place in the short term if we're not able to bring forward funding to get these works uh, underway. Um, and from our five bridges, we've got significant works that are underway um, in terms of, uh, from a security angle, in terms of replacement of CCTV cameras, um, also the lighting Blackfriars Bridge. But I think what might be instructive is, again, following this session, actually to give you that data that we have in terms of the forward plan, in terms of which bridge now, which bridge when, because I think that's, that's possibly more, more helpful than me actually uh, trying to take a stab at that. And to Gareth again, um, what are the estimates for how much it will cost to make these sort of uh, 
the most most the repairs that are most in need? Well, it obviously varies by the nature of, of the asset itself. Um, to give uh, the committee a sense of it, with the Rotherhide Tunnel, uh, we need to do a lot of work, and it's going to be very difficult to do that work. The estimates are somewhere around £120 million worth of work is required to the uh, Rotherhide Tunnel. These estimates do change, as you will know, as uh, engineers come up with methodologies and as those costs are refined and ultimately as we go uh, out into the market to get competitive quotes back to then go and deliver them. But something like a rather high tunnel is in that order of magnitude. Something like Vauxhall Bridge talking maybe 30 to 50 million pounds uh, worth of intervention uh, to that asset. And just uh, in terms of the five bridges, I mean, just as a historic reference point, since 94, um, there's been about 125 million spent on the uh, bridges' uh, repairs and maintenance. But we have a designation for future works of, I think it's 216 million, uh, which is uh, to underpin that, uh, that 50 year plan. Um, so that's uh, happily um, designated for those forward works. Um, fairly simple question, how will you fund these repairs to, to Gareth? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, as, you know, uh, as you know, at the moment, the situation for TfL's funding is very difficult. Uh, we only have very short-term funding uh, from government in order to maintain the essential services uh, that TfL uh, provides. Uh, those essential services are the public transport services, but they also include uh, the highways for which TfL has responsibility and indeed the structures for those highways like bridges. Uh, and at the moment, we only have a very short-term uh, funding horizon through to uh, the beginning of December. Uh, what's really needed is to have a long-term funding settlement that recognises the nature and the state and the importance of the assets of London's transport system uh, and is enabled, therefore, uh, to put sustainable funding so that planning can take place, so that all of these interventions can be coordinated and so they can happen at the right time for those assets, which will reduce the overall whole life cost uh, of maintaining and uh, and improving uh, the, 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 those assets. If you don't do that, you don't have long-term funding and you don't therefore have long-term planning, long-term interventions, what you end up is short-term closures or short-term restrictions to those assets as the engineers have to work on a day-to-day -day basis just to keep them open uh, and to make sure they're safe, which is of course uh, our top priority. Uh, so really for us it's, it's about long-term funding certainty. We need to uh, establish that uh, after the uh, pandemic and re-establish uh, mechanisms for investing in these assets, not just for TfL, but also, of course, for the London boroughs themselves as well. And you've started to touch on this, and also we touched upon it just in the, the end of the last uh, section. What are the implications uh, if the funding cannot be secured and the repairs can't be made at the appropriate time? Yeah, well, as, as I said, ultimately, uh, you know, we don't want to do this, but ultimately, if we don't think the asset is safe, then we'll need to close it. That's the ultimate uh, restriction. That's really inconvenient for everybody who uses that. It causes disruption, causes congestion. It means that businesses can't function and so on, particularly when you look at the strategic nature of river crossings. Uh, there aren't that many of them, and therefore keeping them all open uh, is really important. Before you get to that stage, uh, we are likely to put things like weight restrictions on or to try and reduce the number or quantity of types of vehicles that are going, or indeed to remove vehicles and leave crossings open. Uh, for pedestrians uh, and cyclists rather than vehicles. And you've seen all of those things uh, being played out with, uh, with Hammersmith Bridge uh, under the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham's uh, custodianship. So it is really difficult and uh, all, everyone responsible for assets doesn't want to get into that situation. Uh, we want to have a long-term view and to be able to intervene uh, in the right way that's coordinated and ultimately at lower cost. And to <coughs> widen out the... Yeah. And to widen out the question uh, slightly, um, on m other major infrastructure uh, such as flyovers, fly-unders and underpasses, what are the major challenges in those areas to, to Gareth Powell? Well, they, they can be very similar. They obviously don't have the additional challenges of working over water or underwater in, in that case. Um, but for elevated structures, uh, particularly those that are quite old that were built in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, we have similar issues and challenges with making sure that they were able to intervene at the right time. Uh, that those interventions can be done uh, in a timely way and that therefore uh, the overall cost and disruption co that, that comes from those being out of service is reduced or minimised. So examples at the moment on the A40 Westway, for example, we have speed restrictions in place. We've got a plan there to do some urgent uh, renewal work uh, on there. Same with Brent Cross. Uh, and of course, TfL has had problems in the past with other elevated structures uh, needing further intervention. Thank you. 
taken another assembly member's questions actually really um, sorry could we, could we just uh, yes. pause for a sec because I, I just apologize. want to don't worry i want to welcome it's my fault dr michael horrand nichi arnu who's joined us from new york and is already on the call early so thank you very much for joining us i don't know if you can hear us can you hear us dr horrand nichi arnu no, I think maybe we need to try and sort that out technically, but thank you very much. He was one of our guests for the um, next section of this. Um, can I bring in Assemblymember Best, who was so, had Jack, these... Can I just quickly, on the back of that question about restrictions placed on when you're prioritising, okay. because it does go back into the issues. So it's already in those borough issues that I highlighted earlier on. You've got restrictions, so I'm thinking of um, in... Uh, Bexley, uh, River, uh, River Cray, the River Cray Bridge, going through Crayford, is got uh, no abnormal issues. Is that because you're prioritising about rationing the money and trying to prolong the life of these issues? There are numerous other examples that you've got in Greenwich. There's the height restrictions on. Blackpool Tunnel is part of the, those issues which we know, but so there are restrictions going on, aren't there? I mean, in my colleague who I'm replacing today, Amish Desai's Taramlet, um, she placed restrictions on Rotherive Tunnel. Presumably, that's been taken because you want to pro prolong the life of the tunnel or the fabric of it. How do, how do these work, these restrictions? You've got about restrictions restrictions I think in about 15 areas outside this core river study that we're doing is that because you're doing that con what I'm trying to get across is that because you're trying to prolong the life of this infrastructure and that's an example of how you could prolong it if you continue to not have government funding in, in most cases the reason that a restriction is put on an asset uh, where it hasn't had a previous restriction so as some assets are not capable of handling modern traffic so they will always have a restriction on them unless they're replaced but uh, in the case of the majority of cases, uh, those restrictions are put on because we want to keep that particular asset open. Uh, and therefore, in order to do so, there's a risk assessment process that the engineers and safety experts go through. And they look at the likelihood of, of issues happening and they therefore place restrictions on those assets to the type of use uh, so that uh, we can continue for the majority of road users to continue to use uh, that particular asset and that's typically things like speed restrictions and weight restrictions obviously the, the worse the condition of the asset the more those restrictions uh, you know get increased ultimately down to only allowing pedestrians or ultimately then closing uh, the asset altogether and those are all the things you've seen uh, of course at Hammersmith Bridge uh, being taken by the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham so it's normally for that purpose unless of course there's a permanent restriction uh, on the asset due to the fact that it's, uh, it's not capable of handling uh, particular types of, of goods and loads. And then really the issue is about trying to get a long-term uh, intervention plan and sustainable funding so that you can then remove those restrictions and, and have an asset that is uh, of a very long lifespan in good condition uh, that you therefore can get it back onto a regular maintenance cycle and prevent those, uh, those restrictions reoccurring in the future. In essence, if we don't sort out the funding long-term, or even in the short term, in our case, um, then the continuation of these will be continually being looked at and maybe further restrictions placed on some of these assets, whether they're in central London or in other responsibilities, which are either local authority issues or your own outside the central zone. That's right, yeah. So okay. for uh, TfL's assets, we've, uh, we've had to double the number of assets that have restrictions on them in the past few years for exactly those reasons, because we haven't had the funding to be able to go in uh, and to be able to maintain them. So we need to get back to that sustainable funding and then we can start to reduce uh, and remove those restrictions and get back on top of uh, the overall asset condition of these important bridges and tunnels. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Yes, yeah, sorry. I was just going to add to what Gareth said in terms of um, some of the structures that we're talking about have permanent restrictions on them. So you mentioned Blackwall Tunnel. Yeah, that did. has a height restriction simply because of the nature of the design of the tunnel. It can't take the, the largest vehicles. Whereas someone like Rotherhithe, which has a height restriction, a width restriction, and a type of vehicle restriction as well, because that's an interim measure for safety reasons to ensure that we have the right type of vehicles. But it obviously has an impact in terms of other vehicles that aren't now allowed to use rather than having to divert to other crossings. Okay, thank you. 
I'm okay. sorry some of yours have been taken. Do you want That's to all right, maybe I've got more room to go rogue with some other questions. Um, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, just the first question. Was I correct in understanding it's 216 million is the over 50 years? Is that all the bridge repairs that you would like to do to bring them up to scratch, or is that just a number you think is achievable, or did I completely misunderstand? It, it, um, it's, a, it's a designation in the um, accounts at the moment, so that's effectively ring fenced, uh, looking ahead to that plan. It's not um, saying that every repair in that 50 years will come out of that money, but in terms of the forward plan, um, looking at the, the key things coming up and possible bridge replacement, that's the figure at the moment. But it's a dynamic figure. We, there's a modelling that looks ahead, and that's refreshed. Um, but again, fo following this, I can get more detail in terms of actually how that breaks down in terms of what's costed within that sum. Perfect. So it may possibly be, in order to get every bridge up to scratch as, uh, to, as much as you would like to, it may possibly be a, a larger amount than that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's back to that, almost that sort of graph between those sweet spots about when to repair, when to replace, and actually trying to make the most economic and efficient uh, use of the assets. Thanks. Um, and secondly, I just wanted to ask uh, whether proactive bridge maintenance stopped at the same time as proactive road maintenance. So in terms of the proactive bridge maintenance, um, we're in historically an attractive position, the fact there's an endowment with the ability, because that money came from Londoners for Londoners, to actually keep those bridges proactively repaired. Um, the interplay with the um, highway authorities, the three bridges where the City of London Corporation Trustee isn't responsible uh, for the highway authority, re requires a careful um, planning and uh, uh, interplay with TfL. Um, and then on the other bridges, it's, it's that much easier because the same highway authority and Southwark is there, um, you know, in terms of working with the charity and the trustee. So we are proactively uh, maintaining the bridges, Chair. Sorry, the two uh, bridges. There, there yes. is okay because I believed it was reduced within the mayor's first term. The proactive bridge ma maintenance. It's different. The different. So I'm talking about the five bridges within the Bridge House Estates. Um, charity but Gareth, sorry, so um so we do do um both proactive and reactive maintenance but the proportions as i think i said earlier between the proactive maintenance and the reactive maintenance have changed over the last few years uh, and that's due to funding availability so we are doing more reactive maintenance uh, at the moment to make sure that uh, all highways in in london are uh, obviously safe for use uh, but nonetheless we're doing less proactive renewals than we would like to do because of the uh, short-term nature of our funding at the moment. Uh, so on our bridges and indeed where we're highways authorities, we do do um, a level of uh, proactive resurfacing, for example, in front to make sure water ingress doesn't occur uh, through the highway and into the uh, structure itself. But the amount that we can do is very much reduced compared to where we would like to be uh, because of the short-term nature of our funding at the moment. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Assemblyman Baker, you want to come back in on this? Thank you. Just just a, a follow-up on, on, on this discussion. So to, to David Rowe, um, every highway authority in England receives an annual formula-based formula settlement for highway maintenance, which includes bridge maintenance and uh, refurbishment and uh, replacement apart from London. Uh, why do you think London is, is treated differently uh, by the government in this regard? I'm not sure that is a question to me. I'm, I'm apologies, okay. But, um, apologies. <laughs> feel I, free to chip in. I mean, it, it is it is the case, as I said earlier, that uh, you, you've made the point yourself that authorities outside of London do receive that uh, that award of funding towards bridge maintenance. There are also various funds that uh, different authorities outside of London can apply for where there are uh, particular needs associated with an asset. So things like the um, uh, Transforming Cities Fund, the Pothole Action Fund, um, but again, London is excluded from bidding for those those sources. Okay, I'm Member Clark. It's just just a quick one uh, for you, Gareth. Um, the 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 assets around um, Brent Cross North and the River Brent um, are are in a very sorry state. I'm just wondering what the plan is uh, to bring those back up to a good standard of use. So as with all of our um, structures as we've outlined, we do have an assessment of need. Uh, we know what the state of uh, our assets are and we've got an engineering-led plan uh, to be able to intervene and to be able to bring uh, those assets up to a state of good repair. 
the challenge right at the moment uh, is to make sure that we do have a funded plan to be able to do that. So it does unfortunately come back to uh, long-term funding because without the, a long-term funding, uh, you can't actually let a contract for which you obviously don't have the money uh, in order to finish it. So you end up relying on uh, shorter term, uh, more less costly but uh, suboptimal measures such as reactive maintenance, filling in the potholes and things like that. So the problem with these structures is that they are uh, all of them are uh, in many ways very expensive structures to actually renew uh, because they're big and their their access is, is difficult uh, and so therefore they require uh, a long-term intervention uh, which may span more than a year uh, and therefore we need to have uh, longer term funding to do that so we do have a plan uh, but we won't be able to enact that plan in full until we're able to get uh, some kind of financial stability are you able to share the plan we can certainly get back to you yeah, with what that'd we be have. great yeah. thank you Thank you. Let's move on to our next section, which is looking at river crossing closures, very topical with Hammersmith. And Assembly Member Rogers is going to lead on this. Chair, um, a question for Tom. Um, with your sort of with your experience in bridge engineering um, and architecture, what do you think are the most important things that we can learn from the closures at Hammersmith Bridge, as well as the Greenwich and Woolwich foot, foot tunnels? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> I, I think there's no there's no one thing. Um, I, I would say we're over reliant on too few bridges, and and perhaps also over reliant on too few modes of transport. And and I, I think hearing about the challenges of maintaining these these assets um, make makes clear that. One of the, the, the things the city needs is, is options, and, and, a, and a way to uh, achieve options is, is with, with more, uh, diversifying the, the amount of crossings of the, of the river, um, and also the way we use those crossings. Um, otherwise, planned or unplanned maintenance will, will essentially result in increasing disruption. Thank you. Um, when, when you say diversifying the amount of crossings, what, what exactly? What more, exactly? You more crossings, more bridges, more, crossings. more tunnels, more um, ferries, more ways of getting across the, the Thames. I, I, I think, you know, um, ma maintenance is, is essentially a store, isn't it? I, th I think we need to sort of zoom out and, and see new crossings as an integral part of the long-term strategy of crossing the river, rather than additive nice to have uh, if that makes sense or yeah. place making opportunities you know, eventually these these structures are um are going to become increasingly restricted either permanent or temporary uh, and, <coughs> and that sort of they're getting older um, are there are there any particular parts of the city you think of new crossings that you could see benefiting from from these uh, from new, new crossings oh oh yes um or just everywhere <laughs> everywhere um <laughs> We, we worked a little bit on the uh, Rotherhithe to Canary Wharf crossing um, mm -hmm. with TfL and, and I certainly think as you move east um, the crossings become more challenging because the river gets, gets wider and it's more navigable by higher, more frequent vessels but the benefits are probably greater um, it, and you, c you can see the Rotherhithe Peninsula is relatively um, uh, low density, there's a farm on it and it's a stone's throw away from some of the most high value land in in the country uh, if not the world so um so certainly west um it, sorry east is is of real benefit okay, and we're t going from new crossings to old crossings as we've touched on lots of our river crossings are very very old um are you, do you are you aware of the inspection regime for these crossings uh, do you think it's it goes far enough or is that a question for gareth perhaps yeah, I, I would struggle. I, I'm an architect, not an engineer, and I, I would struggle to comment on the exact inspection regimes. I, I think I think the um, comments that have been made earlier cover it in that it's um, planned and, and, and reactive um, and, and quite specific to the type of crossing, both in its use and in, in its fabric. Um, so so there, I don't think there's one, one regime. Okay. And in terms of maintenance, uh, what more do you think could be done to maintain our existing river crossings? I think you need more information um, and that's something that's very difficult to achieve with existing crossings. Um, it's much much easier to achieve with newer crossings. We've just completed a, a small footbridge um, for network rail that has embedded structural health monitoring in, in the structure and it can therefore sense how the structure is being used on an hourly, minute-by-minute minute basis, um, how it's moving over the years, 
And I, I think more information allows you to make better decisions as to when to do critical maintenance and, and to what extent to do that. And, and it's an area where te technology can certainly help with existing crossings, um, but it's easier to embed more information in new crossings. I mean, actually going maybe to, to Gareth, is that kind of remote condition monitoring technology, is that something that would be, could be retrofitted into some of these older crossings? Is it already there? Um, I think it's extremely difficult uh, to do so on some of the very old crossings. I mean, you think about the, some of the crossings that are constructed in materials you know, available you know, more than a century ago. Um, and the challenge really, uh, I echo my colleague's comments, the challenge is about data of all types, uh, understanding the rate of degradation in, in those assets and understanding the engineering solutions uh, to be able to provide them. We are uh, very keen to explore when we are doing big interventions to assets from now going forward that we do have some form of remote condition monitoring or indeed uh, other types of technology interventions that help us get a more real-time picture of how that asset is performing uh, and how we can then continually update our engineering assessments uh, and so on going forward. The great advantage of uh, remote condition monitoring is of course you don't need to send people uh, to be able to do the same type of monitoring and that means you don't have to have closures of assets and we are using uh, some of that technology in the London Underground, in the, in the tunnels and so on to look at particular types of assets uh, and we've started to use them uh, in my network as well in various areas where we can because it allows us to check regularly the health uh, of those assets uh, and therefore be able to plan our interventions uh, in sometimes getting to them on a reactive basis before anyone notices that they've failed and that's really good to do too. Very, very hard to do that on large-scale civil structures uh, like historic bridges. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we continue to see what's available uh, as we plan those interventions going forward. Tom, Tom back, to, back to you. Based on your experience, um, what levels of investment are required for maintenance over the lifetime of an asset like a, a major river crossing? I, I couldn't I, give you... I, I, obviously, it depends on the asset, doesn't it? It depends a lot on the asset. I couldn't give you a... A number. It's it's significant, as, as you're hearing. Um, it's it's not to be uh, taken taken lightly. I think the whole life cost is a really important feature of um, a, a bridge's viability. Um, I, I was interested to hear some of the structures have a sort of 50-year li lifespan. It's not typically the number we would look for for a new crossing, which might be reflective of the time bit of the whole life cost. We would work to 120 years. We're working on a bridge in Helsinki that's got a 250-year design life, um, stainless steel rebar, <laughs> stuff like that, which ob obviously makes the uh, initial capital expenditure more, but um, it, it's probably one of the most important figures that, that, that comes out of the feasibility of a bridge. So, so understanding that quickly, bef perhaps before you've invested too much in what the bridge even looks like, uh, where it might go, understanding those numbers and make, making sure there's a plan for that um, and, and companies and infrastructure in place to, to, to pay for it uh, is pretty essential. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I've got a couple more questions for Gareth, oh. if that's all right. Thank you. Um, Gareth, talking, talking about Hammersmith Bridge, um, you, you mentioned earlier, sort of talking generally, that the best strategy towards uh, these assets, these river crossings, is a combination of a long-term financial plan and a little and often approach to maintenance. So as far as you um, are aware or can tell, was that approach in evidence with Hammersmith and Fulham Council? And do, do you have a view on what they might have done differently um, in their approach to maintaining the bridge? As, as, as you say, it's, it's not actually our asset, so no, we don't no, have all the information uh, on the asset, nor historically um, you know, on, on what's gone before. Um, you know, I know that it is a very complicated and difficult asset. It's a suspension bridge, and it was built many, many years ago uh, from materials that wouldn't be used uh, today to do that. Uh, so I don't think it's possible for me to comment in specifically of what might have been done, or indeed I don't have the knowledge of, uh, of, of what uh, any individual council may or may not have done. What I can say is that the processes that have been used over the last uh, couple of years to, to inspect uh, the asset, to come up with methodologies, uh, to repair it and so on. TfL has been supporting uh, London Borough Hams and Fulham in that activity. We've been uh, letting a number of the contracts that, uh, for specialist engineers that have been able to go and do that on their behalf uh, and advising them from whatever expertise we have in terms of our own in-house engineering uh, and other planning type 
uh, individuals. So we have been doing what we can to advise them. Ultimately, the decision making is for the asset owner, as it should be, and they are responsible for its safety and its long term planning. Uh, and that sits with Hamsworth and Fulham. Do you think there's anything that TfL would have done differently in hindsight with this situation? And you're saying you've supported the council throughout. Yeah, I, I, again, it's, I can't comment on the on the history because I don't know what interventions were and were not made. Uh, so I can't tell you whether we would have done anything differently. Uh, what I would say is that at the moment we are providing whatever support we can so that uh, all of the relevant expertise are applied to this particular problem, given uh, the nature of the asset is obviously in a difficult position. Uh, it's only very recently been able to reopen to, uh, to pedestrians and cyclists by, uh, by the borough, and for a long period of time it's been completely shut. So uh, we are doing what we can at the moment, but I can't comment on the history, I'm sorry. That's fine, that's fine. And we've been hearing um, from the whole panel about, about how complex the different layers of authority with these assets often are. So when something does go wrong, for example, Hamsworth Bridge or other crossings, how easy is it to look at the situation and point to specific mistakes that might be made by a council or TfL? How do you unpick these situations when they go wrong? So as I think David said earlier, there are um, regular meetings of a group of uh, bridge engineers from all of the uh, London boroughs uh, and, and elsewhere, and they go through and they look uh, at the state of the assets and also share information uh, with themselves as to what's happened in various assets and how learning can be uh, distributed amongst all the engineers. That also includes uh, with Network Rail, with Highways England, with other engineering uh, organisations that are responsible uh, themselves for assets. And we seek, uh, I think, as a wider industry to learn uh, from every, you know, every situation, because every time there is a, an unplanned situation, a series of investigations, engineering investigations are undertaken. More is learned about the behaviour of those materials or what has and hasn't happened, and therefore more lessons can be learned uh, by everybody going forward. So we do our best as TfL to try and make sure that information is disseminated uh, amongst the groups that we're in and also uh, where we can uh, provide links to other authorities outside of London. Thank you, Chair. Okay, can I just bring um, John in? Um, because you've heard from um, Tom the idea we need lots more crossings. Obviously, it's a huge issue of funding them and the lifetime cycle funding. We need lots more crossings. But, you know, my memory of the Rotherhide to Canary Wharf crossing was so many... Um, hoops to get through with the PLA in terms of the height of the bridge and so on for the shipping navigation. What's the PLA's view on more crossings in London? So the PLA is supportive of more crossings east of um, east of Tower Bridge, um, and um, broadly we're location and mode neutral, and we'll judge as you'd expect, judge each uh, application um, on its merits. We'll, we'd have strong views on some locations, and certainly height as um, as you've um, uh, highlighted, and, uh, and as others have mentioned, um, mainly that's around sort of air draft for vessels. Um, but yeah, we're broadly supportive of crossings to the east of uh, Tower Bridge, and that's mapped out on our strategy document, the Thames Vision. And it, it, you think that's perfectly doable, and t to maintain the Thames as a working river as well. It's a balance, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's it's around uh, the height. Um, that that's the issue, isn't it, um, for, for those crossings? Um, large ships come all the way up to, to here and more alongside the Belfast and it's a working river but um, yeah, broadly east of Tower Bridge we're supportive of more crossings Thank you very much um, I move on to Assemblymember Bailey um, Morning all, I was going to ask Tom and John how they felt about more crossings but I, I think the ship has sailed on that one I, I, I think we, <laughs> <laughs> I think we do, we, we, we're in favour of that but I suppose from an architectural point of view let, let me start with Tom does, the, does our experience of Hammersmith Bridge and indeed all of our bridges, what, what lessons can be learned about any new crossing we do from an architectural point of term? We've had terms like whole life cost talked about, we've talked about new materials, we've talked about um, remote monitoring. How, is there lessons that we could learn in these new crossings that we'd all like to see? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a big question. Um, I, I think... One lesson from an architectural perspective is that I struggle to think of another example where heritage assets of such value are being sweated so heavily to support the uh, the, the city's connectivity. Um, you know, you, you, you take buildings, by example, and a, a heritage building can, can close for a, a term and there's an there's a impact of that, but not quite as extreme as if a heritage bridge uh, were to do the same. And, and so... 
I, I think the, the main lesson is to, to find ways to rely less on those heritage assets, and, and that can be done through more, more bridges, of course. It could also be done through more ways of crossing the Thames, uh, more modes of transport. Perhaps there's an opportunity in the shift to sustainable modes of transport, which tend to be active travel uh, cycling, which, which tend to impact heritage crossings significantly less and, and also have significant more uh, throughput, I guess. More, you can get more bikes in the same space as cars. Um, perhaps that's a lesson um, in, in use, that we, we need to take this as a, an opportunity to think differently about the way we use these structures, not just how much load or vibration those heritage assets can support. But, but doesn't that challenge, there's, there's, a, there's a tension there, isn't it? So you talked about a bridge, <coughs> excuse me, that had a 250 year life plan, but was expensive because of that. Yeah. But if we sweat the asset hard, you could then justify a bigger cost up front. So isn't there a tension there? And also when you talk about um, modes of transport, one of the things that we can't get away from because the city is so large, is that a pedestrian bridge, a cycle bridge is great, but what does that do for our commercial viability as a city as well? Yes, I mean, of course, there's a balance between capital cost and, and, and whole life cost, and, and making a bridge more robust does, does tend to add initial cost to the benefit of, of the whole life. I mean, these numbers that we talk about, the 120, 50, 250 years, are kind of arbitrary numbers, and what it does buy you is information and the, the, the more known unknowns, not to be too cliched, but um, you, you get in control of the maintenance more because you can you can foresee it and plan for it and, and you're more aware of what might happen. Everything relies on maintenance. Uh, in terms of commercial viability, uh, obviously vehicles are going to play a part for the foreseeable future, but perhaps not. I, 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 I suppose it, it would be interesting to think again or think differently about how commercial vehicles can be lighter, more, more um, sensitive to the, to the heritage bridges, which might just be a small part of the total bridges across the, the Thames that we, we have um, in, in, in the long, long term. Um, we need to add, add more, really. Um, on, on height, I think that's a, a critical point with commercial viability. Um, it's a relatively simplistic conversation with the PLA, one of height and frequency of opening if it's low enough. Um, but that consequence with active travel um, has massive, massive implications on, on ramps. And, and it really, the bit in over the river is, is the easy bit. It's the bit at the ends that <laughs> are, are difficult. And at one metre of height creates 40 metres of ramp. And, and so um, I, I think that's a big part of the, the cost and planning picture what happens over the land not not to go away from your main question too much no no you you, you make strong points and i think all of that is important we what crossings are planned you know we, we talk about silver town and some people are massively excited about it others not, not so, so much so. Yeah. So, but we talk about silver town we, you talk about different no, modes not. of crossing the river what i i put this to question to both um tom, tom and john and dfl as well what crossings are planned and what's the, 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 the reality of them actually t turning up? I put to the Port of London Authority, would you like another um, tower bridge? You know? I mean, that's an impossible question, really, for me. Um, yeah, we're, we're supportive of Silvertown, um, and we're facilitating that and the, encouraging the use of the river for the construction to minimise the disruption locally mm -hmm. as it's built out. Um, on the others, whether it's the DLR extension or, or, or what, whatever comes forward, um, yeah, we'll deal with it on a sort of application by application basis. But yeah, it's it's not for me to say. I, I, sorry, just a quick sort of additional question: Are tunnels more popular with your folk than than bridges? Tunnels certainly um, remove quite a lot of the sort of dialogue that we've spoken about around things like air draft and you know clearance for vessels. So yeah. It, it, Tunnels um, provide a, an easier um, solution for us. I, 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 I put this to, to TFL. Is a tunnel generally harder to maintain than a bridge, or is it much of a... I, th I think it's quite hard to answer in the generality mm. of it. Um, I would say that, you know, we have, for a variety of reasons, been constructing tunnels more recently than bridges. So uh, in terms of cross 
uh, river links. Obviously, the Elizabeth Line is going to provide a new cross river link uh, down to down to Woolwich, South East London. Um, obviously, we want to do the DLR extension to Thamesmead and so on. Um, and a number of the extensions of the public transport system have been underground, DLR extensions uh, and so on. One of the reasons for that is that, uh, as has been alluded by my colleagues, the challenges of providing an, a bridge to the east of London are that the width of the river is so much greater, so the bridge has got to be bigger, but also the height required uh, is so much higher because of the nature of the vessels that need to come uh, up this part of the Thames. You don't have that uh, further up the Thames because those vessels uh, simply won't be there because the river is much smaller. So in order to balance the needs of the river, as, as, as my colleague from the PLA has said, uh, between a commercial working river uh, and over, then bridges do need to be quite extensive uh, in their size in that part of uh, in that part of London and therefore uh, there have been a variety of different mechanisms but I would just go back to the point my colleague made you know the way to improve the resilience and efficiency of the transport network uh, is actually to reduce reliance on the car as a medium of private transport uh, to be able to increase walking and cycling and public transport through things like the Elizabeth line and so on and then that in itself will free up some of our scarce road space that will allow for more freight uh, deliveries and other commercial activity uh, to continue. So that's the overall uh, direction of travel and we know uh, and it's set out in the Mayor's Transport Strategy that additional crossings to the east of London are going to be required uh, in the medium term uh, for the continued economic development and indeed housing growth uh, that needs to occur there. Okay. And, and, and let me, I suppose the, the obvious question to Port of London Authority, if, if can't we change the shape of these ships? Just how much commerce, how much pleasure would we be losing by not ships. letting these huge yeah. ships because if, if it's two ships a year, I'll, I'll, I'll vote for the bridge. Let's have the bridge. And, and we, we could moor the ships lay, you know, further, further up. Down, yeah. And then you can walk up. Good question. You know, ha, ha, what sort of scale are we talking here? Is it a financial hit? Is it a, what are we talking about here? Are we losing a lot? It's, the financial sort of calculation is, is not really part of it. It's about um, making sure that to where you, where you can navigate to, that there's... Um, there's reasonable access. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a financial consideration, it's a sort of operational one. I, I, I will have to agree to disagree on that. I think the finances are important on that. And, and to TFL, one last question to me, which seems the, the big one for this. Would you like, or would, would this be simpler if you had control of all of the, 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 the full control in the fullest sense of everything that crosses the, the Thames? So you did the bridge ownership, you did the roads, and, and in my, in my um, high, hypothetical situation, there is some funding that comes to help that cost. So you can't just say no on a cost basis. W would that be better from a, from a sort of a logistical point of view? Would it just make this thing less complicated? Because in our notes, the ownership model here is a catastrophe. It's an utter catastrophe. Somebody owns the road, somebody owns the assets, somebody... It, clearly, that makes it hard to get anything to do. A five-year plan just to, to get some maintenance done. So, um, to just unpick that question a bit. So, firstly, obviously, you're right. Um, Long-term funding is going to be important, whatever the model uh, that's had for, for um, bridge ownership and maintenance. Secondly, interfaces will always exist. So, even in the case of bridges where we are both the highway authority and um, the asset owner, there's still, you know, there's still interfaces in the network. And part of the issue of coordination that you alluded to, the, the five-year plan, is because you have to manage the road network and you have to manage the transport system as a holistic entity. So TfL, regardless of who owns which asset, tries to take an overview uh, to make sure that the city can continue uh, to, to function. So whilst if in the case of a bridge where there's a different owner of the asset from the highway authority over the top, there's an interface there... That means the highway authority is probably the highway authority for the whole stretch of the road. So if you changed it around, you had a separate ownership uh, purely for the, for the bridges, you may end up with issues of coordination in different places. So I don't think that there's one, there's one solution that magically solves uh, the issue here. The issue is about making sure that we have long-term funding and that that funding can therefore give a plan that means that the interventions can be properly planned, properly uh, done, and less costly overall. That's the issue, Ra much more so, I think, than the... Uh, than the actual ownership, historic ownership uh, that we've had of different of different assets. I understand that, and, and, it, and it's, it's clearly whatever happens, it is a network, isn't it? Best case scenario is that you, TfL, ran the entire network because that would lower the cost. Because m my funding, if I own the road, may be in a be better or worse condition than your need to 
maintain an asset and then there's a problem there, isn't there? So you want to fix the asset, but they can't fix the asset leading up to it. So the more centralised control might give us a, a saving because, again, th th this map just looks complicated. It looks like when you go in the office in the morning, do you, can you even figure out who you have to call? <laughs> we know precisely who to call on. on uh, uh, that, I'm, I'm going to stop there because the chair needs to get moving, but I, I'm glad you can say that because I just I worry that there's too much red tape and, that, and that's lowering our ambition and raising the cost. That's uh, right. All I would say just on the centralisation point, if I may, Chair, is that uh, we obviously have uh, you know, 32 in the City of London highway authorities and local boroughs who are held to account locally for their local road networks. Um, so there are always going to be interfaces and there are always going to be different priorities at different levels of the transport system. Uh, so TfL is obviously has accountability for London's most major roads uh, and that may be fit uh, the strategic importance of those to London as an overall city. But right down to local roads, uh, they're much more uh, for, a, for a local uh, situation and much less of strategic value to the whole city, but of much greater importance to those who are living, uh, working in, in that local community. So I think there will always be interfaces, is really my, my point. And uh, wherever the structures stop and finish, the, the main thing is to, exactly as you say, to make sure there's very good coordination, that groups exist uh, and that there's overall control. And TfL's role at the moment uh, is to make sure from a traffic perspective that we try and keep London moving and we have that overall responsibility given to us already. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just to pick up um, perhaps with David Rowe, which planned crossings are there, new crossings, that you're working on with, whether it's a borough or someone else? So the, um, Gareth mentioned the, the Elizabeth Line, which is obviously being built. Yeah. Um, there is the Silvertown crossing, which has been consented and is now being constructed. Um, the DLR uh, extension out to Thamesmead is something that we're working on at the moment. Uh, and then the other crossings that have been looked at are ferry-based crossings, so things like the temporary ferry at Hammersmith, uh, the extension of the ferry service out to Barking Riverside. Um, so th that's the sort of range of crossings. There are no other consensus. You're not schemes. looking at any of these other pedestrian ones that have been talked about. There was one Wandsworth area, I think, and obviously all the High Canary Wharf is paused at the moment, but you've been doing work on that. That's correct, yes. I mean, it, a lot of work was done around the High Canary Wharf um, but because of the situation that TfL finds itself in, in terms of the, the impact of the COVID pandemic on our finances, we've had to pause that project at the moment, uh, but it remains a longer term ambition for the organisation. What about these others, like Wandsworth? Was it um, Pimlico Wandsworth? It was a pedestrian bridge being talked about. Is that not something you're linked in with at the moment? It, it, it's certainly a um, project which is being promoted locally and uh, TfL um, has been involved in terms of just providing expertise in relation to bridges more generally. It's not something that we're directly involved in, in promoting at this point. Sorry, Joe, you talked about a project that had been paused. When was that decision made? So the Rotherhite Canary Wharf crossing, um, there was a formal decision not to pursue a bridge, uh, which um, was back in 2019. Um, and then when the um, coronavirus pandemic hit in last year, the decision was taken to pause the work on the alternative ferry solution that was being developed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Assemblymember Berry. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, before I move on to my my second question which is about maintenance um, just wanted to get a bit of clarity from um, John Stevenson there about the rules on shipping but rather than go into them in lots of detail I just wanted to know what it would take to change those you talked about the the navigable part of the Thames presumably changing that involves changing the law or some ancient law somewhere can you possibly explain to us how decisions on what ships need access to what part of London are actually made and how they how they might be changed as, as I think Assemblymember Bailey was suggesting. So a lot of this is um, taken down from sort of global regulation it, there's a broad right to navigate um, as the US um, keep on exercising in, in sort of Chinese waters that you know you, you do have a right to navigate um, and as long as you do it uh, according to the local um, laws bylaws um, yeah you have a right to navigate up or down river um, and yeah that, that's broadly the framework. If you wanted to change which parts of the Thames were navigable that would involve getting international agreement then? Um, what do you mean by navigable? Well, you can navigate up the Thames up to a certain point in, in large ships and then not beyond the, the, the first bridge that is 
the, the bridge there, in fact. Um, that's the limit for large ships. If you wanted to change where that limit line lay, that would involve talking to international bodies so, about, about shipping so bo- rules bo- internationally. Broadly, ships come um, are driven by market conditions and uh, also sort of operational factors. So if there's a mooring that will um, allow them to come to a certain place in the river and there's a sort of market need for that, they'll come. They'd okay, no, that's fair enough. But who yeah. makes that decision? What's uh, the, who, who has the power to change it? Power to change... Where, where the, the limit so I think something of very, so Say cruise ships, because they're the ones that come yeah. up here that are huge. If suddenly a decision they have to dock down in Greenwich, and I can't remember where that got to, there were plans for um, somewhere they could dock. Um, who makes that decision? OK, cruise ships can only go to Greenwich now, and then they have to be ferried in smaller boats if they want Greenwich to come up here. Kilbury, I think, but go on, carry on. With cruise ships, there's multiple um, places along the river, as you said, from sort of... Tilbury up um, okay. and some of those moorings have sort of length restrictions so that would limit the, the size of vessel that could come um, but broadly it, it's as I said driven by market forces and operational um, considerations. So if you were to retire this mooring here which is where we see them mm-hmm. where would the next one be? I mean I could come back to the committee with um, the, the sort of detail of the moorings along the river or at least within the GLA boundary if you want me to but yeah I you don't have You want to come back with some detail on this and explain how if you wanted to reduce the number of large ships or stop them coming up to a certain point how that decision is made and where they would be able to dock if that's the right It'd be really interesting I mean I'm also asking from the point of view of like the emissions because when they dock here yeah. you can see them sending out the, the smoke and I know there's the mayor has no power over that, for example. Would it be right to add, add briefly to that that I, I think the addition of a bridge doesn't necessarily preclude even large ships from continuing to navigate beyond it. Bridges can open, and yeah, but they so cost more to. We, we we know from the example of the Rotherhithe Bridge, it costs a lot more to, to do. It, that. It, it just costs costs more, but it, it just makes the issue slightly slightly more complicated than just just one of height, because at, at lower bridges can have to obviously open more more frequently. Of course, if you went so low that they were opening all the time, they become not a, a reliable crossing for pedestrians and, and essentially uh, almost like a ferry or, or a less useful. Uh, but bridge location and, and navigation limits are, aren't, aren't completely binary and interlinked. You know? No, of course not. Obviously, bridge ships go past Lon- t- uh, London Bridge, exactly, exactly. They just smaller have, ones. They just have to open. E- even big bridges can pass bridges that are in their way. They just have to open for them. Okay. Okay, sorry, just yeah. wanted to get that. Yeah, I no, 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 that's right. I mean, how that could change. It's very relevant because the Rotherhithe mm. Canary Wharf, one of the big costs was the infrastructure you had to put round, I don't know what term to use, the posts going into the, in the bed. Ship impact protection. Impact protection, thank you. Just escalated because of where it was in the river and the large ships that were going to have to go through. So it does add significantly, as well as the height, all these other things just added to the cost, the impact, as you say, and David, um, and it just went out of control. So it does. Um, Sean, do you want to move on to your other questions? Yes, and just, just a final bit of clarification from, from Gareth, um, who I think said that restrictions on things like speed, the types of vehicles, I think in response to um, somebody member Duval's question, it's only ever done for safety reasons. You never do that based on your modelling to, to try and extend the life. You wouldn't cut the speeds, for example, to try and extend the life according using the model. You do that once there's a safety issue. That's, I think, what you said. In the vast majority of cases, so, so firstly, there might be permanent restrictions due to the capability of the asset. So as David said, the asset isn't big enough to get a large um, vehicle through it, so it always has to be restricted. And that's a health and safety, safety car- calculation. Yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. making sure that the wrong type of vehicle, and we have that with low bridges all the time, as you all know, and <laughs> vehicles go the wrong way and, 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 and get stuck and cause, cause challenge. So, so that's the type of permanent restriction. At the other end of the scale, you've got the reactive um, short-term restrictions whilst you're trying to uh, come up with a plan to enhance the asset, and they are typically things like speed restrictions or weight restrictions. In the middle of there's obviously a spectrum because in the middle of all of that, if you have a uh, an asset that is starting to degrade, uh, you know it's going to take you a period of time in order to be able to come up with the methodologies to fix it and so on. You may put a um, a restriction in at that point in order that you don't have to 
close the asset or, or to close it quicker uh, because its rate of degradation uh, may be faster, if I can put it that way. So the engineers do their assessments okay. and they look at it and they say, what's the nature of the issue and the fault that we see and what's the nature of the restrictions that need to be put in place while a remedial plan is developed? That makes sense. So those are all sort of short to medium term yeah. reasons. There's no long term economic reasons that that's done. Uh, only at, as we've alluded before, at the, at the start of construction, when you're planning an asset, clearly you're working out how much first cost you've got to produce depending on the nature of what that what that bridge or tunnel needs to support so obviously the larger the tunnel or the bigger the bridge uh, you know the larger the cost uh, and therefore there is always uh, a, a kind of specification that has to be arised at that, that gives you the balance and so therefore the at the, at the sort of low cost end you might have pedestrians only and at the high high cost end you may have a twin bore tunnel that's capable of supporting all all goods vehicles generally that are on the roads at the moment so uh, that's done at the beginning uh, and then obviously if the asset is designed to that capability but if something happens with the nature of the asset then that capability can be restricted and that's what we're talking about at the moment okay, great that's that's really helpful and that leads neatly into my proper question uh, which i actually want to put first to to Tom, I think, because Tom, you were saying earlier on, um, you know, the design of um, the design of a, an asset might, you know, depend on what it's going to be used for, um, and presumably its its lifetime then also is the same, but also its its ongoing maintenance costs. If you're only using it for walking and cycling or smaller vehicles, that means that it would it would can come with a short a short smaller amount of maintenance costs each year that's that's all built into your kinds of considerations and that also take that's also part of the reasons why you said things like you were putting in stainless steel rebar and things you build it to a higher spec so that it can also have less maintenance cost on a revenue basis you put more capital in at the beginning that's uh, yeah it's a good point so the, the crew knew see that bridge in Helsinki over the 250 year period where it were considering actually considers changing the use of the bridge and you tend to take the worst case use over that time and st think about that um, so you couldn't add a vehicle to a bridge that's been designed exclusively for pedestrians mm. um, so, so that's an important consideration sort of designing to the worst case planned use I, I would say um, and, uh, and then that balance again between initial cost and whole life cost so uh, night access have just done a, a bridge in Pooley in, in, in Cumbria uh, uh, and that, that replaced a bridge that got washed away by flood, flood water so the bridge, the town is called Pooley Bridge and it found itself without a, a bridge um, and that uh, is the first stainless steel road bridge in the UK oh, yeah. um, and so that costs more than mild steel um, or even weathering steel is a popular choice now for um, low maintenance costs but you don't, you don't have to come back and paint it um, the inspection regimes are, are, are different, and so that, that's a balance to, to strike, and it's a financial one, really. Okay, that's that's really interesting, and and there are obvious sort of thoughts amongst the sort of general public that something could be built that was for pedestrians and cyclists and, and small electric vehicles only. That would be a nice sort of I don't know what you call it, like a lightweight bridge, but you'd want to be able to use it sometimes for emergency service vehicles. This is, in an, from an engineering and design perspective, that's the sort of thing you might build. You might build something that was able to take X number of vehicles a year, but wouldn't, be, wouldn't last very long if you started running lots of traffic over it every single day. Yeah, that's, that's okay, particularly for longer crossings. I think the requirement to make sure that crossing could, main, could take an emergency service vehicle. So I think on, on the rather high crossing, there, there were um, pr pr provision for... Um, ambulances and fire, fire engine uh, of, of certain sizes um, but they're driven by professionals and there's a sort of risk associated with that and so the impact barriers and the, the sort of the yeah, yeah the risk um, and, and likelihood of, uh, of things going wrong with allowing that use uh, is different than just designing it for road vehicles uh, it's quite significantly different so most long crossings need some maintenance access e even these uh, vehicles that are designed to facilitate the inspection of, of, of the bridges these um, uh, so it's, it's rare to have a bridge that has absolutely only pedestrian and, and cycle use envisaged throughout its whole life but they do tend to as you see on the millennium bridge res result in much lighter weight structures even though that capability is there for hmm. 
certain small circumstances. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, presumably, uh, Gareth, you're going to pipe up now with the, the like the highways regulations and all of that. So if you wanted, you wouldn't design it as a road because a road needs to be a certain width, have the certain markings and signage and all of that. But something that only in certain circumstances, emergency service vehicles, and I'm and I'm like thinking buses at this point as well slightly. Well, yeah. So 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 as, as has been explained, one of the challenges of uh, bridges and, and other structures is you not only to design them to take the use you intend for them, you also have to make sure that the safety of those travelling on or under them is maintained when things go wrong. When you have a vehicle uh, a vehicle collision, for example, so that's where you get these um, the sort of parapets and other protection devices at the sides of bridges, so that obviously you know try and contain vehicles within the bridge and make sure they don't go into the river or wherever it might be uh, if they have that. Now, obviously, that's all part of the modelling that goes into how you might design uh, a crossing. And and as has been said, uh, it's very different um, if you have general traffic going over such a crossing. The sort of provisions you might need. Uh, it's very different for two way as well as you can imagine with vehicles facing each other than it is um, for, for a, single, you know, a single directional use. Um, and therefore, all of these considerations change both the design, the size, uh, and ultimately the cost uh, of that. So for example, if you only had uh, a, um, a crossing that was predominantly for cycling and, and walking, um, then you would design it with those users in mind. And as been said, if you needed to put some sort of emergency vehicular access to it, or indeed uh, heavy, you know, a vehicle for some form of maintenance had to access it, it could be designed with that in mind, but that would be under very different operating conditions yeah. because it would be a controlled thing by, driven by a professional, properly briefed probably, who'd be able to do that. So <clears throat> these, all these things are taken into consideration at the very outset of the, of the project. The thing that I think we're talking about in part with here is that obviously what is envisaged at the start, so horses and carts in the Rotherhide Tunnel, uh, ends up being very different when you have vehicles uh, travelling in that tunnel now. And then the job of the uh, authority of the day, TfL, in, in, in our case, for the Rotherhide Tunnel, is to try and make sure that you can upgrade the facilities within the tunnel to, make, to, to have the best possible usage uh, within it. But it is, a, it is a very difficult thing to get right. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, so my, my question, um, which is, I think, to um, Gareth and David, who, who run Bridges, um, there is this sort of opportunity cost that you create when you make a new crossing, aren't there, of the, the ongoing maintenance. That's an, on, that's, a, that's an opportunity cost. You could do other things with that, that maintenance funding. So um, do you think we can take on more river crossings with our revenue situation as it currently is. Gareth and David, um, your, the question to you is, is essentially, are you keen to take on more bridges? You said you have a surplus. I know it goes to good causes, but has anyone suggested to you that you might take on any of London's ailing bridges in any way? Um, but yeah, starting with Gareth, I think. Okay, so, um, so you're absolutely right. The, uh, when making the case for the investment for the bridge, uh, take into account the first cost of the bridge, but also the ongoing maintenance cost that would be there. And that adds a continual cost to TfL, in this case, if it were our bridge, and ultimately to, to the city. Clearly, that is balanced against the economic benefits of having such a um, facility in terms of the overall uh, city and, and supporting its function. So as to whether or not we could take on such things, well, two things would need to be the case in TfL's case at present. One is that we would need to receive uh, capital funding. Uh, we don't have a long-term funding settlement and we don't have capital funding uh, to be able to produce uh, a new crossing. And then secondly, as you say, uh, we would then need to have a sustainable uh, funding stream for the maintenance of that new crossing, which is exactly the same as the, the issue we have on all of our roads where we don't have a sustainable uh, funding source to be able to, to do the maintenance and upkeep uh, of those roads at present. Um, and for Silvertown Tunnel, that's, there's a... There's a David yeah. answer? Just oh, sorry, yes, yeah, so do you want to... I was just going to follow up on that question. I thought you'd go on to it of his own accord. Do you? I just, I just <laughs> didn't know if you'd forgotten David there. Uh, yes, sure, David, has anyone asked you to, to take over Hampton's um, Bridge? Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of Bridge House Estates, you've got the objectives for the charity, which is very much focused in terms of entry points to the city. There's a geographic integrity to that historic, um, albeit Millennium came late, but it was bang in between two of our bridges. Um, so in terms of that, you correctly say, correctly say more money spent on 
the bridges. Um, so long as you're up to absolutely the, um, the sweet spot that we've been talking about, so that balance between replacement and repair, which we are able to do with having an endowment and being able to look forward and having a secure income stream, there is a direct correlation between communities of London through our ancillary objects, the City Bridge Trust piece. So you know, there has been, it's just shy of half a billion actually distributed to charities across London tackling disadvantage and inequality. So um, we are quite unique in that regard. But I think in terms of the direct point, uh, yes, both uh, when uh, a different conversation, but when the Garden Bridge was a proposal, um, that was uh, directly asked whether we might take on or support that. Um, and then more recently, um, Hammersmith too. Um, we are very keen to work collaboratively with people in terms of the expertise that we have, you know, the engineering, the economies of scale that can actually be drawn from that. But in terms of the integrity of the, the objectives of this charity into the, the, the city, uh, we're not keen to take on any other bridges. Okay, and can I just a quick follow-up question? Because obviously I do want to get onto the PFI question. Of course, it's a very interesting on, one. Yeah. Um, has, have you been in any talks with Transport for London or anybody else about given the history of the, the source of the endowment, um, new <coughs> road charging schemes and policies. Because obviously when you start talking about tolling bridges and crossings, which we will be um, introducing when Silvertown comes in and, and Blackwall starts to be tolled as well, there's obvious potential implications for your bridges further up. Um, and there's obvious benefits to integrating all bridges and indeed all roads in London into something a little smarter that could also do things like let like Keith know more smartly when, when things are, cl are closed. So have you been involved in any talks about this as an obvious stakeholder in this? So I haven't personally been involved in any of those, but in terms of the displacement prospect that you uh, directly um, uh, allude to, it's absolutely key. It goes with the same thing as if you close a bridge, if you then put a whacking great toll on one bridge, people may vote with their feet or their vehicle or their bicycle. Um, so I'll check with my um, colleagues on the engineering side in terms of any detailed conversations. I'm not aware um, of them myself, um, but I would imagine that if they're going, going they are part of You'll have, you'll have been back. a consultee in the... Um, the planning DCO process for Silvertown um, in terms of the, the projected impacts it would have um, once they start the tolling. But I just wondered about forward-looking plans for something smarter. You've not been involved in any discussion. As I say, I haven't personally, but I mean, it doesn't mean to say that some of the colleagues... Okay, uh, if you can find out that, I'll come back on, yeah. on that, if I may. Sorry. Just okay. add on uh, Silvertown Tunnel. So certainly the, the city were involved in terms of uh, when we were developing the charging regime that we put out to public consultation. Because um, obviously we try to identify a set of charges that ensure that you don't generate additional traffic to either Silvertown or Blackwall, but also that you don't displace traffic onto other crossings and lead to longer journey times. We also have something called the Silvertown Tunnel Implementation Group, of which the City of London is a part, and all of the work that we're doing in terms of developing the charging regime, the bus network and so forth, is, they're, they are consulted as part of that. Thank you very much. So, yeah, going back to, to Gareth, um, I was bringing up the fact that, um, obviously, things like the new um, Emirates airline, the cable car, we built that, we're covering the maintenance of, of that. Um, I imagine that's not a massively significant cost to us, but maintaining Silvertown Tunnel would be. So we've made a PFI scheme. Um, why, why was that chosen as, as the, the right thing to do? And why, aren't, why weren't all the other schemes that have been put on hold now PFIs instead? Well, so new crossings, uh, you have the opportunity to work out how to fund those new crossings. Um, Silvertown Tunnel uh, was chosen to be uh, a <coughs> PFI, which means that the borrowing is undertaken by uh, the entity that's that's building it rather than the borrowing being undertaken by TfL or by government or by elsewhere. There's still borrowing undertaken, it's just being undertaken in this case uh, by them. Um, what will happen is that once the um, charges are levied, that will be used by us to be able to pay them uh, for the access and that will pay off ultimately the cost of providing that facility uh, from those that are, that are using it. Clearly, the charging regimes for new or existing assets is a matter for each one of those assets because as David has just said uh, you need to do the modelling to look at the displacement and the level of those. So I know for example that the London Borough of Hampstead and Fulham have talked about uh, potentially a, a toll solution for uh, the repair methodologies they're thinking of for, for their bridge but clearly all of these things have to be done on the case 
uh, that they are. Uh, as to your question as to whether uh, PFI or some other financial model uh, is appropriate for the future uh, or not, well, that will depend on a number of things. One, it will depend on the nature of what's being built and whether it can sustain uh, that type of arrangement going forward. It will also depend uh, on wider, broader policy, both government policy and uh, by the mayor of the day and so on, making those decisions at that point in time when the project uh, is incepted. Clearly, in any case, the money has to be found up front to be able to build the asset, and then in many cases where that's done by borrowing, it then has to have a revenue source to be able to pay off uh, that borrowing over time until the whole asset is paid for. Okay, I mean, obviously, Transport for London spent quite a lot of time and effort pulling itself out of various PFI deals, and we, we understand government is now not in favour of PFI as a, as a general way of paying for things. Um, this would seem to be the last time this would be done, um, as far as I can tell. Um, is, that, is that correct? And if you are thinking about future tolling solutions, wouldn't it be better to have something that was a bit more integrated? I mean, obviously, you're, you're paying for the maintenance and the build of the Silvertown Tunnel through the PFI payments, but also for quite a lot of profit within that contract and something that was a bit more in-house and able to generate money for us that stays within the public sphere, wouldn't, would that be a good thing that you might be in favour of, of doing? So I can't say, obviously, whether or not PFI or some other similar mechanism will be used at all in the future. I, I, I can't say. Well, what, I, what I can say is at the moment there is no plan to toll all of London's crossings or something in, in, you know, under development at the moment. What you allude to, though, is the issue of finding a sustainable source to both manage demand and to be able to pay for London's roads. And that's a much broader question. It doesn't just apply to, uh, to bridges and to tunnels. It applies no, no, obviously, to, but today we're looking at bridges and tunnels. It, 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 it applies yeah. to a much broader category of things. So, uh, you know, and I would say, as, as you will know, that we do operate uh, a central London congestion charge that does manage demand in that area and does produce uh, revenues which are able to then be reinvested back into the transport system. Yeah. And I think you just, you just took, made a really good point there, which is that it could be used to manage demand as well as raise funding. And I think... The discussions we had earlier about the increased resilience you might get from reducing, for example, the amount of traffic across each individual bridge, could you could put, you could make a business case for that in terms of the reduced reduced maintenance costs or the the reduced need to do replacements in a in a forward window of time. I think one would design the asset the 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 bridge to be capable for what you needed it for, and then you you kind of work back yes. from that. I think that's you wouldn't want to start out thinking of a payment mechanism to change it. But you know, everything's in the mix, isn't it, in terms of the usage type of the thing. And as David said on, on, on Silvertown, you know, very much in terms of Blackwall and, and Silvertown, the overall package, including the charging uh, and so on, means that uh, that will be a, uh, you know, a crossing that doesn't uh, generate vast quantities of additional uh, traffic and does improve air quality and, and allows for additional public transport uh, options. So I think there is there is a way of bringing it together, but it will depend on where it is and it will depend on the nature of what you're trying to build. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I was just sort of saying that if you were designing a road charging scheme, a smart one for the whole of London, then the benefits in terms of being able to create more resilience with our sort of critical assets would be one that you'd have to take into account. Certainly, the, I mean, if we're talking about something that manages usage of the highway across all of London by means of, uh, by means of charging, uh, well, most certainly, I mean, that, you know, <laughs> that's a much different thing. That's a very, very different policy intervention from what we're talking about here, which is a specific bridge or, or, or crossing. Uh, so I'm not sure I could answer in the generality of whether it would improve the maintenance. Certainly, if you have less volume of, of vehicles by whatever mechanism, then ultimately you'll get a slower rate of degradation and you'll end up with... Uh, with less, you know, less repairs to do. That, that's certainly true. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Assembly Member Prince, you want to come in on one of the other unusual crossings we have? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, we alluded a little bit earlier to the Woolwich Ferry, Gareth, and um, I think it's fair to say that the, the previous service was not overly reliable. But uh, to mix metaphors, I'd have to say that the current service is a bit of a car crash, really, isn't it? And I know that I believe that the, there either has or there's about to be a change in the providers, but you're, you've taken control of it. But why is, why is it such a mess? Why is 
the service just not operating even when it's operating it's often just one boat I mean firstly uh, I'd like to apologise for any users that are inconvenienced by uh, the Woolwich Ferry. You're absolutely right, but uh, there, are, there are basically two or three things that have impacted that service over the last few years. Uh, the first was that new vessels were introduced, and actually those vessels are now performing uh, pretty well, but during their introductory period, uh, there was a lot of issues with the way in which those vessels interacted with their mooring devices uh, and so on that need to be worked out by the engineers. So they didn't work uh, as they were promised to do uh, you know, when, they were, when they were first uh, available. Then the second thing you've been talking about, through the pandemic, uh, alongside other transport workers, there's been some really fantastic work done by our frontline colleagues. But at the moment, for example, uh, there is a high level of um, test and trace pings and other things going on uh, with people. So that, the Woolwich Ferry crews are not immune from that, as other, uh, as other uh, workers are. And then thirdly, we have now taken over the operation of the Woolwich Ferry. Uh, and as part of that, we're in discussion with uh, the trade unions about how uh, what we might move forward with the, uh, with the workforce. Uh, and at the moment, unfortunately, uh, there is a dispute uh, and there have been strike action taken uh, by the trade union and their, and, and their members. Uh, so we were working really, really hard to resolve the issues uh, that, are, uh, that, that are there. Um, I would say part of it is related to the pandemic. I think we've overcome the infrastructure issues and we're continuing to work through uh, conversations with, uh, with our colleagues uh, about how uh, best those uh, workforce issues should be resolved. Do you see any light at the end of the tunnel, or...? <laughs> the end of the ferry. <laughs> <laughs> like the end of the... yeah. Absolutely. So uh, we're in productive conversations at the moment with the, with the trade unions, and, and, and there are you know, many colleagues uh, working really hard to keep that service going in the face of the, uh, of the pandemic and, and elsewhere, and we're really confident uh, of moving that issue forward. Do you think anything had to do with the way that the initial contract was tendered? For the previous contract for the... For the yeah, because you, you've taken over the running of it now. Yes. So clearly before then it was contracted out. Um, do you think there were any issues around that, that way that contract was tendered? I can't comment in the detail. What I would say, though, is that um, we're certainly very keen now we have the service uh, in-house. One of the reasons for bringing it in is because uh, when you've got an outsourced provider and you're replacing... Uh, the, in this case the vessels, there's obviously a lot of unreliability potential uh, and that doesn't help when you've got an outsourced provider. What we're able to do at the moment is to, uh, we've brought the service back in-house, we're able to make sure we can invest for the reliability of the vessels as they need to be uh, and we can have the necessary conversations uh, with our new employees uh, about how to make uh, their working conditions good and how to make sure the service is resilient going forward. So we're able to do that now, uh, we're doing that very actively uh, at the moment uh, and obviously an outsourced uh, arrangement uh, is a different way of operating and, and has different parameters and different incentives in contracts that were let uh, many years ago. So I can't comment on the specifics of that contract. What I can say is that now it's in-house, we're able to have those conversations directly uh, to really try and improve the, the service that people need. Of course, um, bo both uh, models are used by TfL, so uh, the buses, for instance, are run on that way where the, the services are contracted out. And, and in some cases, you provide the buses, I believe. Um, but what experience does TfL have of running ships so um, TFL as a we're not a, um, a historic uh, ferry operator but what we have done of course is then to hire uh, people into our team who have exactly that experience uh, for doing so so uh, the, the general manager of the of the service has said about 30 years of maritime experience in a variety of different organizations as does uh, the head of maritime safety that we have and others that are in there. We ourselves need to do, needed to develop the capability and also the processes to be able to operate uh, a vessel and that's independently regulated so we have to receive a license which we have done uh, and it's independently assessed uh, very regularly as to how those processes are operating. So TFL as an organisation like any other uh, organisation that wants to operate uh, a ferry service uh, needs to go through the fact to demonstrate to independent competent authorities that we have the right people uh, and the right processes in place that we have done uh, we have those individuals they're very experienced and they're working really hard to make sure that the, the service on the Woolwich Ferry is improved. So does that mean that you might consider taking over the Clipper service then? <laughs> we have no plans to uh, take over the, uh, the, the Clipper service uh, as you say. Uh, the, the circumstances of the Woolwich Ferry are particular to the Woolwich Ferry 
uh, new vessels in service. We have an obligation to run that service as TfL. Uh, that's set out in statute. And so we must run that service. And we took the view that the best way to run that service in the circumstances we have it at the moment is in-house. And the fact that you have to run it for free and therefore can't make any revenue from it, does that not colour your, uh, your approach? No, we want to make with a number of our services, like the highways that are provided uh, without charge to users in many cases, we want to provide the best service we can. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we do just that. Thank Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, just can I ask officers to make sure that we have got our link sorted to New York? Because I did see it. Uh, I saw our guest earlier. He's in the meeting. He's just got his mic. His that's fine. Yeah, OK, just that. making sure because that's our next bit. And let's move to the final question this section. Assembly Member Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is to, to Gareth again. Does the current way of coordination between asset owners work well, and what changes, if any, would improve it? I do think it works well uh, between asset owners. We've worked uh, very hard over, you know, over the last number of years. There are very good relationships at each level. So we have good technical working relationships between bridge engineers. They, they all know who each other are. They meet regularly to share uh, advice and so on. Uh, we have good relationships between authorities and then TfL takes an overview, as I said before, in terms of the movement of, uh, of traffic and, and indeed people across London. So I think those arrangements are, are working well and there is a good level of both knowledge and coordination. Great. Just, I'd like to know how conflicts are resolved. I mean, it, for example, if TfL wants to fix a bridge in order to keep the transport network moving, but the bridge owner does not have funding um, to take immediate action, how is this sort of situation resolved? So certainly um, between adjacent bridges, there are mechanisms for coordination. And if we can't agree, then there are mechanisms for escalation and ultimate decision making. Um, between the highway authority, I think you're saying, and the, and the, the bridge asset owner, um, you know, we have very active dialogue to, uh, to make sure that's not the case uh, and that planned interventions could be done in a, in a coordinated uh, manner. It hasn't arisen for the ones that TfL have. I've been working with the Bridge House Estates and we have a combined plan to be able to do that. Um, so we haven't had experience of that circumstance. Do we want to just, just come? Sorry, because one of the reasons why we're doing this is because of the Hammersmith. I think we can call it a debacle, why right? Not? So I think first off, emergency action having to be taken, and that's great because professionals are on top of it. We understand that, and then coming across these uh, little bits of who owns what, who's responsible for what, and who should fund it. We're now in a further farcical situation created by government that their uh, solution for funding it is they're going to pick up two thirds because you're going to need the money because you haven't got the money. So presumably your third, if you were disposed to put in a third, would have to come from them. Them, And we know that the local authority hasn't got the money. So the issue is, is whilst all this is going on, which is all important and proper discussions are going on, and, and that looks maybe okay from uh, your point of view, the public are looking on it bizarrely and thinking, what is going on? Can anyone act like they're in crisis? Now, of course, the standoff is understandable and blame that goes on with that, but people just want resolution to it. So I think on the surface of what looks OK actually has potentially got some more problems further down the line, isn't it, if we can't get the funding right where there's ownership in doubt and who's responsible. Now, in this case, um, you know, maybe personalities come into it as well. I'm thinking of one particular local authority about their stance on issues around that. But equally, what's the solution for the future? What's the solution to resolve it? Because on the surface, looking from a consumerist point of view and the public looking in on it, I would thought, hmm, a plague on everybody, really, because I don't think you've got the interest of keeping everyone going. So then they will work out what they're blaming. So, so just comment a little bit more to Anne's question about actually, you know, is it all right or not, using that as the example of what we want to avoid in the future. So what should we be doing then? What's the issues? Now, you, you're a professional advising politicians. You can't say what politicians are going to do or not do. But what would you think, from a professional point of view, should be the way forward for doing this um, yeah. and resolving these issues in a in a timely manner albeit we know we know it takes time to rectify 
some of these problems. I think that's the issue. So, how do you avoid a yeah. Hammersmith Bridge? So, first thing, I don't. Th there isn't any um, lack of clarity of, of kind of ownership or accountability with Hammersmith Bridge. It's very clear uh, that the, the the bridge is owned by the local authority. The issue you refer to is actually yeah. one of funding, um, yes. as to how. Uh, you know, bridges in that condition can be funded, and if it's uh, possible for any one local authority within the resources that that local authority has to be able to afford uh, to repair uh, a large historic asset such as Hammersmith Bridge in this case. The solution uh, is to have a long-term uh, set of funding to, for, for either the asset owners to, uh, to, to bid into to be able to do that, or, to, uh, or for a strategic authority like TfL to be able to either manage or allocate uh, in some way. Clearly, for all asset interventions, that long-term funding is so important because it does allow long-term decision-making and not short-term uh, decision-making. So, uh, as you say, I'm, I'm not a politician, but you know, from a professional perspective, it would be much better to have long-term sources of funding in which individual asset owners, and it doesn't have to be one asset owner, it could be different asset owners, are able to put forward a case uh, to say, this is the condition of my asset and I would need to have this amount of funding uh, in order to be able to do it. Either internally, if they have lots of money themselves, when I mean, they've been set up in a historic trust or an endowment or other things, or to other bodies if they're not able to fund it themselves. And I think that's, you know, for these strategic assets, that's, a, that's an important part of it. And given, given where we were and where we've got to on the government decision around their option to spread out the cost, I mean, in reality, the government's going to have to step in, haven't they? Unless we go back to an earlier intervention that was made earlier on, that we're going to actually start to toll some of the issues. So part of the deal, and cameras, they do seem to me, open up the prospect of doing mini road pricing, stroke issues, to fund these issues if government isn't prepared to step into the ring. Because at the moment, I am right, you haven't got the money to put into Hammersmith Bridge. So it would only come from a government deal right, in terms of part of the discussions that go on in, se in September. I presume Hammersmith and F Fulham isn't an authority at risk like Bexley or Croydon uh, are in terms of their finances, but they would have difficulty in stumping up their money. So again, it will come back to government. So really, isn't the solution for all some of these issues is a form of road pricing tolling to maintain some of these bridges because we haven't, no one, there's only one authority can decide whether to establish that fund is central government, doesn't seem willing to do it. Is it not fair to say that the long-term future for the maintenance and funding issues are going to be down to some form of tolling or payment issue unless someone comes up with a... Uh, you know, a magic money box to fund and put aside for this. I can't see it, uh, even, uh, you know, just professionally. And I'll ask you to say what TfL's position is. I'll try to take a view of you all. But unless someone s establishes this fund, uh, and given where London is versus the rest of the UK in these issues and the way government is treating transport funding in London, it's not likely to happen, is it? We've got to present some other solutions here. Or government is going to have to accept that the freeway funding for Hammersmith is not a solution. In different times, it might have been a solution, but it's not at this time. So, to answer your question, certainly you are correct. Um, from a TfL perspective, we're currently in receipt of emergency government funding to support our operations on a day-to-day -day basis, <clears throat> and therefore we don't have surplus funding available uh, to, to put into other assets for which we're not responsible. So that's, that's definitely true. I can't comment, obviously, on the financial health or otherwise of the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, how they fund uh, wh whatever part of the cost that they ultimately will bear or not uh, is a matter for them. I note that they have said publicly that they can't afford to, uh, to, to pay for the bridge uh, directly and they would want to investigate some form of uh, tolling uh, or some form of uh, other arrangement that allows for the money to be, uh, to be found. Uh, so that's, that's a matter for them as to how they do that. They are the asset owner and it is uh, their bridge. From a technical perspective, uh, you're correct that the use of cameras and automatic uh, number plate recognition and so on does allow for smaller scale uh, schemes to be uh, put in on point-to-point -point assets. It's the same type of technology that's widely used, such as the Dartford Crossing and elsewhere, uh, that enables for that to happen. So that, that, that technology uh, exists. And then as for what is 
the right kind of sustainable funding source for these assets. I think it does uh, come down to whether it's about the use user of that asset, such as the tolling, or whether it's about a wider input from some form of other uh, wider funding, which is generally either from government or from devolved authorities. Mm. Uh, Just going back to the follow -on, very quickly on that follow-on question, because I think the member opposite in terms of uh, Assembly Member Berry was talking about the coordination and issues. So as soon as a single local authority started to suggest that they want to explore tolling, isn't that then appropriate that someone like TfL says, mm, thank you very much, you should transfer the asset over? It shouldn't be down. I mean, you know, I'm call me old fashioned. Local authorities hopefully were used to teach when they controlled schools, people to read and write. Uh, empty bins, clean streets, uh, speak up for their area and in some circumstances maintain the roads. Some circumstances, I say, if I'm commenting on some boroughs. But the question is, isn't that strategic, the, the, the role of a strategic coordination about funding issues and those issues that is when someone should step in and say thanks very much. I'll give you an example. Back in the 1990s, I was leader of an authority that did a PFI for a DLR station. And Stephen Norris at the time, not even DLR, said thank you very much when we presented it to him. It was a pure P PFI scheme as a scheme back then. And said, no, we'll take this on. And they ended up funding the station uh, that's in Cutty Sark in Greenwich Town Centre at no cost to the local authority which was always my plan if I could have. So the question then is, shouldn't, isn't there a role for a strategic authority to step in and say, thank you, London Borough, transfer that asset, you no longer run that bridge, we will take that on and then work out a tolling regime if it was politically decided that was the way forward to, to introduce that for the, for the coordination uh, that the Assembly member said earlier on that's needed in terms of funding these schemes? Well, certainly there's a role for TfL in coordination, um, definitely. And if any one local authority were to come forward with a, uh, any form of, uh, of, of road charging scheme or indeed tolling for bridge assets or indeed uh, whenever there's big interventions made into, into um, road networks, TfL has a role to make sure that all relevant authorities and stakeholders are consulted. And as was talked about before, uh, with bridges, there is uh, obviously the risk of displacement into other areas. That's not just an issue for TfL, that'll be for other local authorities that own uh, bridges adjacent to the one uh, that was in question. So there's definitely a role to do that, and I think that is a role that TfL performs today uh, and, and obviously will perform going forward. I, do, I, don't, I, I think that's quite different from the ownership of the asset. The ownership of the asset is where it is at the moment, and any change in ownership of that asset uh, is for the asset owner to determine. Obviously, it's their asset. Um, and so it would be for them to do as well as for uh, anyone else who wanted to, to take on those assets, whether in the public or the private sector. So, um, you know, I do think the, the main point you make is true, though, that there is a coordinating role that's required, uh, and TfL is performing that role, I think, today. Okay, can I just finally just ask, is there not um, the possibility that, forget your finances at the moment, but in the, the every asset owner could be putting into a sink fund, if I can call it that, um, certain amount of money every year that then, whether it's TfL or whatever, helps to coordinate a bit like David's got in the city, this historic fund, which then helps pay for it so that it's not suddenly, you know, political, you know, politics changes in councils, different administrations, they don't put money in, they do, that you've actually got this fund, it's continuous, that all the asset owners put in a certain proportion every year, that, that you can then properly plan to maintain the bridges. Is that something that could be a possibility and TfL could have a role in? I'm sure that is one possibility going forward along with a number of others. Um, you know, clearly the most important thing is to build up either a fund or a funding source that operates over the long term that is sustainable. That's the most important thing. How that's arrived at you know, could be done in a number of ways, I think. Yeah, and obviously government would have a role to play those. Well. Lovely, thank you. Well, we're now going to be joined. Now, let me just clarify here. So our guest from Milan has had some personal issue come up. I don't know if it's to do with the virus or not, but I hope they're well. So Piero Pellizzaro is not going to be able to join us from Milan. I will try to arrange a call with, as I think we're also hoping to have one with Paris, which um, committee members will come to to chat with them to get their evidence. But we have been joined and he's been waiting very, very patiently and the, hopefully the um, network is working. So we have got Dr. Michael Horadnichianu, 
who is a professor at New York University and was the former traffic commissioner of New York City and is quite an expert in this area. Can you hear us, Michael? Yes, I can. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us from New York. Um, we've got a set of questions to ask you, and we may bring in other panel members, um, particularly um, our architect friend who's got that international experience as well, um, just to give us some context. So, Assembly Member Bailey, you're going first. Good morning, Doctor. May I call you Michael? Please. Thank you, Michael. Look, I'm, I'm going to ask the big question. What's the best financial model for maintaining assets? We've had a big conversation in London. Sorry, Chair, but this is part of the questions in the next section. Am I asking the wrong question? No, you're not. Who's no. asking? Six. He's doing six, you're doing seven. Oh, OK, fine. Yeah. Uh, are we OK? Fine. Fine. Yeah, so I do apologise. So, so, so I'm asking a big question. What's the, what's the best financial model for maintaining assets? In London, we have many assets. Many of them are very old, as our guests have told us. The bill is big. And of course, everybody wants a big check from government. But in your, ex in your experience, what is the best way to maintain these assets financially? Well, um, <clears throat> let me... Uh, 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 preface uh, my comment and the fact that um, the uh, money that government has and everything that we're talking about here is uh, the construction and maintenance of this uh, uh, infra of the infrastructure uh, has to come from only one source. Let's remember that. Government has no money of its own unless they print it. The, the money that government has is actually taxes that we citizens of a country, whatever country it is, pay. So that's what the, the money that we have in order to build and maintain. So if you start with that, one of the major and important links that I will make is because I'm, I'm, I'm listening to what Vic said from the, you know, for me early this morning. And, um, while the responsibility for operational control is given to a specific unit, the uh, financial obligations seem to be whatever they are. And although you have an obligation of doing it, you are actually not um, uh, have the, uh, the, the funding necessary to, to maintain it. Now, uh, I am a, 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 a big proponent of what I call it the life cycle uh, of a facility. You do not build a facility unless you know that you're going to have the ability to maintain it. And throughout my years, in, uh, and I have served in government a, uh, a number of times, once as traffic commissioner for the city, and actually, interesting enough, I, I, I've had interaction with London. At the time, there was a gentleman named Michael Shersby that he was a uh, member of the parliament that, for whatever reason, came to New York, and he thought that New York was doing well compared to London in terms of traffic. Meantime, I think things have kind of equalized. But um, the point is that um, uh, it's very important to understand that if you build a facility, in order to have it long term, you have to make sure that you have the necessary funds to maintain it. So the life cycle is the most important thing. Now, as to how you get the funding, it's a little different, but let's all understand that we're going to get it from the people that use that, is not or not. But if you look at uh, the money necessary, it will uh, come from the people. Uh, uh, do, are you? Suggest, but we we have that, that basic understanding. It, we understand. But here in London, we have some of our services that are subsidised. The, the buses, for instance, for instance, are subsidised to a very great level. But we also have a transport network that has many <coughs> ageing assets in it. And one of the biggest pleas we've heard it ably um, demonstrated this morning by our members from TfL is that they would like long-term funding so they can plan. And, and it seems to be the conversation in London is we cannot have that long term planning unless the government just say we were going to give you a certain amount of money over a certain period of time. Would you do you believe that's the only way to do it? Or do you believe that we, we there's a different a different model that could be used to deliver that, that long term stability? OK, there is a tendency and this is normally the tendency that I have seen in many or operations, organizations that are um, government uh, 
related is to kick the can down the road. It means if I don't need it right now, I'm going to let the next one take care of it. That's the wrong way of approaching it. I heard all kinds of words, endowment, and, and the bottom line is that the funding uh, necessary to uh, maintain the assets need to be there. Now, let me make it very clear. New York is not much different than other places. Uh, the bridges, uh, New York City today operates around uh, about 790 bridges that need to be maintained continuously. And that's, that's a very important uh, aspect of uh, what is the New York City Department of Transportation. Now, in addition to that, there are bridges that are tall, and this belongs to uh, either uh, if they cross the Hudson River, it's going to, that is actually crossing from one state to another, from the state of New Jersey to the state of New York. Uh, these are actually uh, maintained by the Port Authority and they have the responsibility to ensure the viability and, and long-term operation of uh, uh, bridges and tunnels across the Hudson River. And then we have a number of tunnels and bridges that actually connect the city of New York, the various boroughs, to the center, so to speak, that is Manhattan. So they have their own operation and funding that is actually generated by through tolls primarily. So it's and actually solely by tolls because part of the tolls are actually in mean, subsidizing uh, uh, public transit. But uh, the bottom line is that the rest of the bridges are all maintained by the city of New York and is their responsibility to do it the proper way now. That's part of the budget that the city of New York sets aside for the Department of Transportation to actually operate, so to speak, because uh, the way the um, city of New York uh, works is that we have two budgets, a capital budget and an operation budget. The capital budget is responsible for building uh, or rebuilding for that matter. Uh, if you have a major bridge that needs to be reconstructed, what you will have is the money comes from the capital budget to operate, to make sure that you do the proper continuous maintenance. That's part of the operational budget. And in fact, i um, be more than glad to share with you. There is a report, a yearly report that comes out that actually details the work that is being done at what level and how by the city of New York. So that's really the generic answer. Then we can look into real uh, specific things. I, I think your, your answer is displaying some of the differences between London and New York. You have greater localised tax raising powers, for instance, so you, you, your budget, you, you, it would appear you have more flex in your budget and transport would be a big part of that. Because for us locally to impose taxes to to boost our transport budget, we could only probably really do it through fares is, and, and, and tolling. And I don't know how much of a, an appetite well, London has had. Tolling today, due to the, uh, the technological advances, can be done based on the vehicle miles of travel, actually. So you start looking to see, and not just that you're crossing a, a, a road, but uh, uh, the amount of uh, vehicular, not just the, the, the number, but also the vehicle miles, the, 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 uh, the amount of, uh, of travel that occur on certain facilities. And that can be actually today uh, very much uh, uh, charged uh, against different types of vehicles, different owners, and therefore the contribution of the overall vehicular traffic in a city can then be used to support maintenance in the generic maintenance, so to speak, uh, by collecting from everyone, because you cannot just say, oh, okay, uh, one bridge uh, charges and another one does not. Uh, then what happens is most people will try to find a way to travel on the roads that are not uh, uh, tolled. 
So it's very important to look at it in a more unified fashion. Yeah, I, I think we're beginning to have that conversation in London with road charging, which some of the members are very excited about. Others, like myself, wonder how Londoners will pay more to drive in London, but less to drive outside of London, which would be strange. But, but let, me, let me move on to, to a, a slightly different question. What would be the best model for governance to, to maintain our assets? Because I, I don't know if you've seen our notes. One of the things is our ownership of assets and, and, and running of those assets is very, very complicated. I described the, the, the part in our notes that talks about our assets as, as a catastrophe because some are owned here, some are main, they maintained there, some assets have two operators, not, let's not say owners. What is the best model for governance to, moving forward to make sure we can use these assets properly? Well, there is a need for um, a unified responsibility towards transport. And you start uh, breaking it up, uh, you're going to end up with various issues. So therefore, the first step would be decide who is going to control. If it's uh, 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 Transport for London, that's the one. And now you have to also allocate to them not only the responsibility to carry out the duties, but also allocate to them the ability to uh, um, create a fund that will be uh, responsible for managing these assets that will uh, live in perpetuity. And, and I think that uh, looking at, at various assets and bridges and tunnels are assets, the question is, what does one need to do to maintain them? And I use the word perpetuity, uh, although you know everything has a, a life of its own, but, but once you start uh, maintaining it, you can extend its useful life for a very, very long time. And in that regard, I will say to you that on a personal level, I was involved with, in effect, uh, uh, working on the Queensboro Bridge, that is a very large bridge, uh, on Williamsburg Bridge that was an uh, encounter in the 80s when I was commissioner, a disaster uh, by, uh, you know, it was a failure of maintaining the bridge. And, and, and then, and actually I was working also on the Brooklyn Bridge that is today also undergoing changes. And um, as part of the university, um, together with some uh, private enterprises, we looked as to how we will increase the connectivity between Manhattan and the other boroughs uh, for pedestrians and bicyclists that are actually now are being looked upon and, and given priority in terms of their ability to, to be able to uh, uh, transport people. And, and the idea of the micro transportation has actually penetrated the, the uh, whole thought as to how we connect with new bridges that will be able to service that. And the question would be not only where you find the money to build it, but how you maintain it in perpetuity. You can't write charge uh, pedestrians to cross a bridge. F thank you. J just a quick question to Gareth Powell before I stop, Chair. When, when, when we, we, we propose new assets, Silvertown Tunnel, ever, does that appear in your maintenance bill going forward? Do you plan for the maintenance of that or any asset that you need to take on? So is your bill growing as we get new assets or are you expected to stretch that, that, that budget as opposed to it's part of the planning process to add to the budget? So, so every time we, uh, we conceive of and then bring a new asset into service, uh, at, at the point at which we conceive it, we also estimate how much it's going to maintain, it's going to need to be maintained during its life. And that's either a little bit every year in concept or sometimes there are planned renewal moments where you know you need to intervene in order to do a planned replacement so uh, you know train fleet's a very good example of that where you do maybe do a midlife overhaul so uh, yes absolutely whenever we have a new asset we've got to set aside or got to have funding in the future to be able to maintain uh, that asset and that's where the the long-term funding stability is really important so you can be confident that you have that long-term ability to maintain the assets for which you're responsible. Is there a typical projection time that you'd make for a given type of asset, a bridge, a tunnel, a train, or is that case by case? Well, in terms of, as I said before, in terms of, I mean, the assets themselves can be hundreds yeah. of years, you know, yeah. design life terms. Uh, realistically, in the terms of a long-term capital plan that you put together, 50 years is a good 
uh, a good working assumption. It's a good, you can see sort of 50 years into the future, you know, what's going to happen in 100 years is very different, very difficult for people to predict in terms of usage patterns and technology. So we tend to look on the long range up to 50 years and 25 years, and then we have historically as TfL done either 10 years or five years worth of financial planning, if you like, to make sure that we have the allocation over those years. Of course, at the moment, uh, that time scale is very much restricted because we only have uh, a financial settlement until December of this year. Chair, sure. thank you. Assembly Member McCartney. Thank you. Apologies, Sean. Um, my, my questions, Michael, are around New York City bridges themselves. And what are the biggest challenges that they are facing? Um, and what are the emerging threats that have been identified? Well, um, one of the things that um, tends to um, uh, stress the system is clearly its utilization. And, and strangely enough, well, not, uh, or, uh, is the fact that uh, for the moment, uh, public transport is operating as about, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, loads, uh, less than 50% of what it used to be. As a result, a lot of demand is now being put on the local uh, um, uh, traffic on bridges and roads. Uh, and uh, uh, New York, by the way, is considering what uh, uh, London has already had is uh, the congestion pricing. And, uh, and you can look at it any way you want. You can call it for congestion purposes, but also the idea is that whatever money is going to be generated by congestion pricing can then be utilized to, in effect, give back both in the area of public transport as well as maintaining some of the assets that now are being told. Um, the, uh, um, so, so uh, the fact that New York has so many uh, uh, bridges, uh, and some of them have been transferred, by the way, from the operation, from, from actually the responsibility of the state to the responsibility of the city, uh, creates uh, new demands on the city to, to be able to fix that. A good example is a, a major highway uh, that uh, goes through the borough of Brooklyn that is actually uh, in effect a structure and, and that is going to cost in order to rehabilitate it. That was kind of the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, over the years, the, the uh, maintenance was actually uh, done by the state of New York. The city only had kind of looking from the outside, now he has gone to the city where they need to think about multi-billion dollars rehabilitation of that particular facility. So that is something that unless one plans in advance for all of these uh, occurrences, uh, it will place uh, additional demands on the city. Thank you. And London has been in a similar position um, with COVID. Um, pandemic, meaning that ridership has been drastically reduced, so for fares income is not coming in. But I think unlike New York, um, London has um, nearly three quarters of its um, operating budget from its fares, and I think in New York that's around 40%. So it's interesting to see that even New York is looking um, w worriedly at its future financial outlook. And I can see from the financial outlook from the Metropolitan Transport Authority that's recently come out, that actually some of those discussions are being had. So I think what you're saying is that the current model that New York uses to fund its bridges, repairs on its bridges, is not fit for purpose anymore. So they are looking again at how they can get in other revenues. Is that correct? They are looking at additional revenues. Uh, the city of New York right now, um, like most uh, major metropolitan areas, uh, were hit by COVID uh, as, and, and the economy as uh, lagging. And as a result, the, the revenue to the city uh, that is primarily from real estate taxes uh, has gone down. So, so there are all kinds of issues uh, uh, that need to be addressed going forward. And that's a major concern 
uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, the necessity of having additional funds. Now, like any place, um, the city of New York is part of the state of New York. And there is always tension between the bodies, not to speak of the fact that we had also a federal government. Uh, but the, the hope right now is that the federal government is going to come up with an infrastructure uh, fund that will allow uh, also uh, cities like New York to benefit from it and, and be able to, to uh, uh, get things done a little uh, easier uh, by providing uh, in effect, uh, uh, they were talking about $650 billion that will go into, uh, uh, into infrastructure, uh, just purely infrastructure, not social infrastructure, but physical infrastructure. Okay, thank you. That's interesting. That's perhaps slightly different than what's happening um, here. Um, how are the bridges currently funded, the repairs? They're all funded through the... Uh, uh, you know, there again, I said the capital budget and any time there is a need for a major reconstruction, the money is being borrowed uh, through uh, what we refer to the you know, municipal bonds and the municipal bonds have an advantage that are tax free. So therefore, um, uh, are uh, pretty desirable in terms of tax free from the point of view of the federal and state taxes. Um, and um, and the, uh, the, the basically the, the operational budget is through normal taxation. And that's uh, today due to the uh, basically slowing down of the, um, uh, um, the economy. Um, they, there, are, there are holes in the budget that need to be filled. Okay, thank you. Chair, I think the other questions have been answered okay. previously, but thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move to Assemblymember Berry. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for what you've said so far. I just wanted to ask one quick question of clarification. I believe um, there are tolls on the tunnels and some of the bridges. Is, is that and right? bridges, yes. And that, 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 that money goes to the Metropolitan Transport Authority. Where am I? That's correct. And by the way, I was... Uh, uh, at the MTA, I was president of their capital construction for nine years. So and that, I'm pretty familiar with that as well. <laughs> Excellent. So that is that, that seems to be a separate organisation from the New York City Department of Transportation. Is That's that, correct. So is, is it's, it, a state, it's a state organisation that creates uh, always tension between the state and the city between the mayor and the governor and so forth so that's always there okay so there's a there's a ring fence between those toll operated bridges and tunnels and the public transport system or is the public transport system under that the as well public transport system is part of mta it is also part so it's all in the same that's organization. correct so yeah. so yeah. It, it, at one point in nine i believe it was in the 60s in 65 or thereabouts a number of units that was the New York City Transit, the, uh, uh, the uh, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and TBTA, right, that is the operation of the tall bridges and tunnels, they were put under one roof. So all of the maintenance of uh, vehicular and, and uh, tunnels and bridges uh, that are part of TBTA uh, are actually being funded from the tolls that are being collected. Now, just to be uh, uh, very clear, uh, the number, the tolls are also part of it, uh, in addition to maintaining these facilities, and they're well maintained, I must tell you that, um, is being used to, uh, to actually fund some of the improvements on the uh, New York City Transit, the uh, the uh, railroads, uh, the commuter railroads, and so forth. So there is a, there is there are funds that are being collected from vehicular traffic that are being the transferred to uh, uh, to the oper the railroad the mass transit operation. Okay, that's really useful. So yeah, my questions are really about governance. I just wanted to make that sort of clearer. Um, so who sits on the Board, the body that runs the, the Metropolitan Transport Authority, and how does that 
differ from the the mayor's office and the I, I think that um, you will be able to get a, uh, the best answer from the current head of uh, transport for London uh, uh, Mr. Byford mm. used to <laughs> okay so uh, he's not here today though transit, and I just wanted so to get it on as familiar as I am uh, but um, uh, the point is that there are appointees uh, from the government and there are appointees from the city of New York there. The majority of them are coming from the governor, from the state of New York. Uh, I think there are six of them, uh, and then four from um, uh, the city, and then there are what we call quarter pounders, that there are some uh, uh, counties around the city that they uh, have a, uh, they can appoint a uh, just, uh, a quarter of a, a vote, so to speak. Uh, so I think that there are four of them. So, uh, in fact, leaves the control to the governor. That's that's really really interesting. So it's much less of a sort of executively run thing than we have in in London, where the mayor sits on the board of he's the chair of the board of TfL. Um, when he wants to make decisions, such as what fares to set, that those are more or less decisions up to. To him, one person. That's not the case in New York. You have a presumably quite a lot of back and forth between the different yes, priorities. Yes, place. but in general, I would say that the control is with the state of New York because this is an authority that services not just the city, although the city is the focal point in which uh, the various commuter rails come into and and the the the, 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 the tolls on on. Um, on the various uh, uh, facilities are being actually also controlled by MTA. And by the way, the new um, uh, the, the, the discussion and the, the new uh, congestion pricing will also be controlled by MTA because the funding from the congestion pricing will go primarily to, uh, um, to provide uh, funding uh, for capital construction for MTA in general. The expectation is that um, about $1.2 billion uh, will be generated by congestion pricing, and that will allow, in effect, to uh, uh, come up with a $15 billion in capital construction funding. That's excellent. I'm trying to stay off finance because we've done quite a lot of work on finance and just think about the governance a little bit more, though. Sorry. Um, the, so that's, it's really the governor who runs things rather than the mayor of the city. That's, that's how you... On this particular case, um, the governor is, but the governor needs, in, in, in no doubt about it, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the mayor to agree and cooperate and that always, uh, if there is agreement in that, and, and, you know, I would say that in general, that has been achieved, um, uh, they are able to uh, uh, get some things done. Um, I, you know, it's just uh, like anything else, when you deal in politics, you need to, un to understand that there is give and take. Absolutely. And, and so my, that leads me nicely onto my next question, which is about, um, transparency and accountability of those organisations. I mean, you've named there basically three democratic organisations, the governor's office, the, the city mayor's office and, and some of the counties. You've got good freedom of information rules in the United States. Presumably, there's a lot of transparency when there are negotiations going on between uh, there those is, different There is groups. transparency because of the need to, uh, to report constantly and, um, uh, and, and both um, um, the city council has the ability and right to call upon uh, the heads of uh, MTA to come in and report. Uh, so I would say to you that uh, there is a continuous reporting on the, oh, I guess, the intricacies of uh, uh, what's gonna get, be done and, and how and so forth. Now, like anything else, um, sometimes these things do not necessarily uh, uh, perk out uh, to the public uh, soon enough, but in general the answer is there is transparency. So therefore people will hear and know what's going on. 
And does that extend towards um, things like the state of maintenance of different assets? I realise there must be some sort of yes. security implications that, there. The answer is there is always a struggle to come up with the dollars. However, a good example of something that happened in New York, New York used to be a, a town that uh, if you live in New York, you never pay for water consumption, period. You got your water for free. That uh, And the water comes from maybe 160 miles north of the city uh, through a very uh, um, complex uh, system of viaducts. Now, the, um, um, at one point, uh, because a lot of the uh, uh, streets under the streets, uh, you have the, uh, the sewers and the water mains and, and other utilities, uh, the, there is the, someone came up with the idea that if we can charge for the water uh, usage, uh, that money can be utilized not only to actually fix the sewers and the water mains, but by having to, to, to uh, excavate in the streets and do that, one will end up actually also rebuilding the street infrastructure. So that's one way of funding a lot of it. So that's happening as we actually speaking, that, that the money that, that comes from uh, this uh, uh, new, let's call it authority, that collects money uh, from the residents on water utilization is actually being uh, utilized, the money collected is being utilized to maintain the, the asset of streets. That's incredibly interesting. Just to clarify, that's a that's at a state level that that. No, levy. it's at the city level, so not the, the state. So the city has the power to levy for the water charge yes. to cover. That's yeah. We certainly don't have that in London. <laughs> that's really interesting to know. Um, coming on to my next question, then I guess. Um, in fact, no. Can I ask you one more about transparency? Because I asked you about transparency on the state of maintenance of the bridges. If people wanted to know how the bridges and tunnels are in terms of maintenance, there must be some well, limit. The, the, the state um, uh, really, uh, through its proxy by actually controlling MTA, they are controlling a number of, uh, uh, actually a uh, couple of tunnels and a number of uh, uh, bridges, large, long span bridges that are actually being maintained by MTA. And that's a pretty, uh, uh, it's, it's, I would say to you that uh, it's high transparency on that because it's just, uh, they are not that many and, and they, they need to be maintained in order to continuously uh, be able to charge tolls. And the tolls being charged are actually, a part of it is being utilized to maintain itself. So, so yes, there is a lot of uh, transparency on that. Uh, north of New York, there is, an, there is a number of uh, bridges that are also actually operated by a state uh, bridge authority. And this is outside the city, north of the city. And, and they are um, in effect, uh, again, uh, it's uh, very clear. It, it's uh, uh, the tolls that are being collected are being utilized to maintain the bridges. So, so that's a, uh, it's, it's in, in that regard, money is not moving to other uh, endeavors. It stays with the maintenance and uh, rehabilitation of these bridges. Okay, that's really useful to know um, that even sort of commercial confidentiality doesn't stop you knowing where your money's going. That's, that's really useful. Yeah, it is. And then do you have the Port Authority that has uh, a number of bridges, some very large, and uh, that uh, and a couple of tunnels uh, that connect New Jersey and uh, New York. So I was going to ask about that. That's my final question. That's really useful. Um, we, we talked earlier and you probably heard us talking about shipping and the ability to to use our waterway, which is the Thames in London. Um, and I don't know New York that well, but as far as I know, the, the Hudson is wide and is the sh is a shipping route and i think yes there are the restrictions Hudson, in a similar uh, way is true it's sorry. wide they have i'm sorry did i uh yeah you? sorry can i can i finish my question is that all right oh, i'm Just sorry i i didn't then it'll help us to get I... through it in one go um 
Yeah, so presumably the, the Hudson still has restrictions on things like the height of bridges, the number of bridges, the things that might block the shipping lanes. And can you, can you just tell me where the power lies to, to set those as well, if that's all right? Okay, both, by the way, I just want to make sure that you understand both the Hudson and East River are navigable waters and the Coast Guard, that is a federal, basically, agency, has the obligation to make sure that the navigable channels are open. So the heights and the location of the channel cannot be obstructed by anything that bridges that are being built um, uh, will actually impact that. Uh, and even the new bridges that uh, uh, we proposed uh, not long ago uh, that are pedestrian bridges, uh, and uh, they will have to be high enough uh, to allow for the navigable channel to exist on both sides of Manhattan. The connection on the Hudson that is very wide, as well as on the East River that is not as wide. Okay, that's really interesting. And so changing that would be at the federal level if you needed that's to. That's correct. You need to comply with that. Okay, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Lovely, thank you. I've got the final question um, to you, Michael. In terms of, you've obviously heard some of our discussion this morning and the complexities we have in London. What do you think London could do to improve the management of its river crossings? We've talked about financing, but how we manage them, because we've got so many different owners in the capital. I would say that it's very important to, if you, want, if you give the responsibility to operate to an entity, you have to also give them the ability to actually um, uh, have to be able to collect and get the financing in place. Uh, separating between the two, it, it's actually almost saying, I'm giving you the responsibility to operate. I'm going to hold you accountable, but, uh, but I'm not going to give you the money. The two do not go together. If you're going to hold someone accountable, you have to give them the, uh, the ability to manage. And that is not only to operate, but also to have the proper financing that goes with it. Yes, there are uh, uh, controls that need to be put in place. But what I heard this morning when you know, listening to you guys is that although the operation is much clearer who is uh, supposed to operate as to who is going to pay for it is not. Absolutely. And there are various sources. And I would say to you that you have to kind of pull it together into one location. You can't allow that to be kind of going all over the place. Lovely. That's really helpful. Thank you so much for your contribution this morning. You must have got I, it very early I have to, to join thank us. You. I, have, I have to thank you for one thing, for actually flawlessly pro, uh, uh, being able to pronounce my last name that is not an easy one. Anyone that ever asked me how I pronounce my name, I say carefully. So. <laughs> there you go. I'm glad I got that right. I, I can't pretend I haven't been rehearsing it this morning. So thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Do any of our other guests want to add anything following what we've heard from New York? Is there anything you want to pick up at the moment? No, I'm seeing shakes the heads. Lovely. Well, can I thank our guests um, this morning? So we've had um, Dr. Michael Horodnichianu. And we have also um, got before us, thank you, David Rowe, Gareth Powell, um, let me look at most, David Farnsworth, John Stevenson, and Tom Osborne. Thank you so much for your contributions this morning. It's been really helpful in our discussion. Um, members, can we um, thank our guests and note the report and the discussion we've had? And can we also delegate to me authority as chair in consultation with the deputy chairman and party group lead members to agree any output from our meeting? Agreed. Lovely. And on to our work programme, item six. Can we note the work programme and network rails response to the motion on tactile paving? Agreed. And our next meeting is scheduled for 10 o'clock on Monday the 13th of September to be held in the chamber. And I've got no other urgent business. So thank you, guests. Thank you, members. I end the meeting. Agreed.